Okay, good morning, everybody. I think we'll um, I think we will kick off with with the webinar this morning. Um, my name is David Kelly, and I'm the director of the Southern Region Assembly. And look, you're all very welcome to our webinar on the renewable energy investment in the Southern Region. I know, as I said, we have a very good lineup of really good speakers today. Time is pretty tight, um, and I think the, the panel would probably be more interesting to me. So I'm not going to keep you too long. Maybe just to set the the scene or the context for or the background behind the, the webinar this morning. Maybe just to say um, at the beginning that we have a very ambitious vision for the Southern region and um, to become the most creative, innovative, greenest, livable regions in, in Europe. This ambition is very clearly set out in our regional spatial economic strategy, which came into play um, in January of, of 2020. Um, I suppose it also cuts across our work in terms of managing EU funded programs and projects and will form an integral part of um, our next iteration of the regional development program, regional operations program, which we're currently um, in development. I suppose this ambition permeates or reflects or filters down from the high level policies in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it comes from the at EU level in terms of the EU Green Deal, from government in terms of the government's climate action plan and so on. And it's really about, I suppose, the transition to the low carbon economy. And you know, it sets, I suppose, an ultimate target of reaching net zero emissions. And um, you know, it's an ambitious target, but it's a target that has to be achieved. I think it will be achieved, but it will require significant change in order to get there. But I think we have to remember that the changes that are required to, I suppose, deliver on this or achieve this will also have wider positive um, benefits in terms of the economy, in terms of wider society. If you look at, I suppose, the health benefits in terms of and cleaner air, warmer homes, in terms of jobs with a more sustainable economy go going forward. Um, but I think, I, I, I suppose, a range of actions or range of interventions, or it will require a multifaceted approach in terms of looking at maybe energy efficiency measures and um, carbon capture interventions, electrification, and of course, renewable energy production. Within the recess, we have some very strong objectives around um, renewable energy for the region, um, including one um, about the development of a renewable energy strategy for the region. And Kevin will talk about the regional spatial economic strategy um, a little bit late, later um, in, in, in the session. Um, but we believe overall there's huge potential for renewable energy in the southern region. Recently, I heard Minister Ryan speaking about the comparative advantage that Ireland has in terms of renewable. And we think this is particularly true for, for the southern region. I think delivering on this will require a coordinated action, I suppose, at all levels of government. And I think local authorities will have a particularly important role to play in this regard. Of course, funding is, is going to be a huge consideration to deliver on the um, objectives that are set out in the regional spatial economic strategy, to deliver on the high level targets that are required. I think investment is going to be key. Um, and it's going to require, again, a coordinated effort at national, regional, local level to support renewable energy investment um, across the region. Of course, we all know that the National Development Plan is currently under review and the consultation has been extended until the 19th of February. Um, and it's going to be, I suppose, uh, we will have to expect that the whole transition to the low carbon agenda will be a serious consideration in the identification of investment priorities going forward. But I think it's, it's, it's important to, to recognise that no matter how important and significant public uh, investment is, public funding alone is not going to be enough to deliver on the, I suppose, the really high ambitions that are, are set. So we have to look at and examine all funding options to include both private and public sector in that mix. And this will require greater knowledge sharing, greater collaboration, greater networking across the, the public and private sector to achieve on this. I suppose this is one of the reasons which prompted our involvement in the Interreg Europe Fire Spot project. And it's the Fire Spot project that really has been the catalyst for, for this webinar today. Um, a key objective of the Fire Spot project is really to look at and try to examine, I suppose, new and innovative funding models or funding mechanisms to boost renewable energy investment. You know, looking at things like financial instruments or, or revolving funds. Um, this project is um, a partnership of energy agencies and managing authorities um, from across six 
six uh, member states, six regions in, in member states from Spain, from Germany, Croatia, Latvia, Poland, and, and ourselves in Ireland um, in the southern region. And it's really about sharing best practice, sharing good ideas, sharing experience to try to identify solutions and how we can support or boost um, investment in, in renewable energy solutions. I suppose one idea that has emerged um, throughout our work in, in the project is really around the establishment of a renewable energy energy forum to really, I suppose, to share experience and knowledge. Um, I suppose today really is a, a testing of the water in, in that regard. So um, this, I suppose, in, in a sense, is probably maybe the first in a series of seminars. So we, we I suppose, and I suppose the outcome of today and the feedback from today will, will dictate, I suppose, how that goes. In looking at this in a little bit more detail um, throughout the project, um, we appointed Sustainability Works, and you will hear from them a little bit later, to do some stakeholder consultation or analysis on the feasibility of establishing a, a renewable energy um, investment forum. And the feedback has been quite positive, so I suppose that, that prompted, prompted today's seminar. So look, over the course of today or even after today, it would be good to get some feedback from you um, on the idea, your thoughts, any further ideas around um, around the, the idea of the Renewable uh, Energy Investment Forum, wh whether it, it's worth um, maybe putting it on a, on a more, more stronger footing. Okay, well, look, I think that kind of sets the context or the scene for, for this morning's webinar. I think you've probably heard, heard enough from me. As I said, we, we have an excellent panel of speakers um, who are going to discuss this topic from national, regional, and local level. We're also going to hear um, a couple of uh, case studies interesting case studies again from local and, and European level. Um, in the agenda to start off we have, um, I'm delighted to say that we have Minister uh, Eamon Ryan. Um, can the Minister, if he's here, can he turn on his camera? Hiya David, sorry the Minister's been on just to say he's been a little bit delayed. Late. Okay. But okay. Look, that, that join us. So maybe if Kevin, who is our next speaker, uh, I think we'll keep the flow. He'll be setting the, the I suppose the landscape for that regional kind of outlook. So. Perfect. Okay. Th thanks very much, Karen. Okay. Well, look, the minister has been delayed, and hopefully we will hear from the minister later. So look. Okay. We just rejig the agenda a little bit, and um, so in that regard, then I will ask uh, Kevin Lynch, um, to discuss the regional space and economic strategy and the, I suppose, the renewable energy objectives that we've set in that. Kevin is the Assistant Director and the Senior Planner um, in the Southern Regional Assembly. So. And uh, thank you very much, David. Um, uh, it, I, I, it, it's, I'm happy enough to sit in, in before the Minister in the sense that my uh, presentation really is setting the scene, I suppose, of the overall context of uh, the, the, the topic in relation to investment, but putting it into the much more broader uh, context of the region and of the region spatial and economic strategy. And uh, the, there's quite a number of more detailed speakers later on that, that will delve into that. But what I want to do is really just firstly set the scene in the statutory and kind of locational sense. So next slide, please. Yeah, just firstly, just to say briefly who we are, David has outlined this in overall sense, but again, it's probably worth just pointing out who we are, we're Southern Regional Assembly, where uh, we, we, our, our work relates to the, the, the bottom half of the country, the, the local authorities of, of Munster, plus Kilkenny, Carlow and Wexford. And we've a, a statutory function really in relation to spatial and economic strat uh, economic policy and also uh, European funding um, and I suppose that that's grounded and brought together through the regional spatial economic strategy we have two sister assembly organizations with EMRA in uh, in the east and north the and northwest in, in the northwest so uh, next slide please Karen yeah the our main work uh, over our last number of years has been the regional spatial and economic strategy. And there's been a number of these strategies over the years, but this one is different uh, in one particular key sense in that it's a statutory document. And it provides the link between the national level spatial and economic development and the local level. So our strategy, which was published on the 31st of January, uh, last year uh, sets out a 12-year overarching strategy for the implementation of the MPF. It, it takes on board really the, the, 
the overall objective of the MPF, which is for balanced regional growth. And it looks at uh, changing Ireland where there's a million additional people in our country over the next 24 years. So it looks at, you know, that we need to change um, where, where that population lives and how we live and uh, the, the energy supply to our country. The key to that is the ongoing growth of the eastern region around Dublin and that there's need for balanced growth for that. So we talk about anchoring that on the growth of our three cities, Cork, Waterford and Limerick, and, and broadening out that development to the rest of the region. In many sense, as I say, it's a, we're talking about a growth of a million population in 24 four years, and it, it is a disruptive and uh, document. So it, it requires a lot of change in, in, in the way our society will develop. The next slide, please, Karen. And I think an important role for us is taking from the national level through the MPF and the National Development Plan and, and taking the, the vision of that document and giving it expression to the regional level. I suppose an important point to say about our role is that we're grounded in uh, the democratic function in that uh, our, the assembly is uh, made up of uh, uh, councillors representing each local authority. So they bring to that uh, the expression of, of each local authority's ambition. So the process in developing the strategy was over a three year period and had significant involvement from the public and at the democratic le level. And I think that's very important in that it grounds it in that. And also, as I say, that statutory element of it is important. So next slide, please. Yeah, and then on to the next level, we work, our document then sets the context for uh, the constituent local authorities through, importantly, through the development plan cycle, uh, which is underway in all 10 local authorities at the moment. And that's really where all this and the, the, the policies for energy are, 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 you know, come to the fore. And that's where, where it, it's at the local authority level that uh, as you move, move down through the hierarchy, this is where it, it, it gets serious because it, 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 uh, it has its expression at the local level. So as I say, our document is, the, the recess is very important in setting that framework. And we work with the local authorities in, 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 in the development of that process. I suppose an important point to say as well in terms of our role and our approach to this is that we work in a kind of a collaborative manner with local authorities that, that in, in that, that, that is the, the best way we see um, in, in a supportive and uh, we, we working to and fro with each other. Um, we have limited resources in terms of funding and manpower or, or, or staff power in relation to it. So our, our, our role is to be efficient and to work in a collaborative manner with those. And that is quite effective. That's our overall philosophy. Next slide, please. Yeah, getting down to the, the recess itself. Again, this reflects the MPF. Uh, as David outlined, our, we have an overall vision for uh, developing a creative and in innovative region, a livable region, and a green region. Now, it's extraordinarily challenging. As I say, we were talking about a growth of 350,000 population in our region to about, to about 2 million uh, by 2040. And within that, that there's multifaceted impacts on, on how that will happen, including, uh, in, in, including energy uh, underpinning that. So we, we have, uh, we, we have uh, 11 strategy outcomes that, that are grounded in those three themes. And then beneath that, then we have uh, over 300 objectives uh, in relation to the development of the region. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think this is an important slide in setting the scene for the topic in that it, it works at the change that we see uh, happening within the region and how we, how we distill down the ambition of the MPF. On your left hand side is the, the, the tailored settlement approach and that really sums up our strategy in relation to, to how we see the region developing. It's anchored on our three city, which are three cities which are targeted for over 50% growth by 2040. 
Now that's extraordinarily ambitious. That is fifth, half again on top in a 24, 25 year period on top of what has developed through all of history. So that, 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 that encapsulates, I think, the ambition set by the MPF for us. Then that's distilled down through a series of 14 key towns uh, tr throughout, or throughout the region, which then anchored that, uh, the, the growth level within the cities. And then we talk about the development of our towns, uh, towns and rural areas, um, not, not specifically through just sheer growth of those areas, but also a change in our approach to economic development, making sure we're at the forefront of developments in Europe in relation to that, and changing our approaches to, to, uh, to energy and, and the like. The last component to that is very important in that we're not talking about the, the growth of our three cities or key towns as discrete items. The networks between those, between our rural areas and our towns and villages are also important. Um, so I, it would be true to say that the focus in terms of the research has been on that side of the document, in terms of the spatial side of it. But it's also in the title of the research that it's uh, an economic strategy. And that, that between that spatial and that economic encapsulates uh, a whole range of topics, including you know, social uh, and environmental and, and energy use. And the connection between our economic growth goes back to our settlement strategy with our the base in the first instance of the growth of cities and how that works down through the through through the the rest of, of the region um, and then within that is um, as I say a, a change and making sure we're at the forefront of uh, developments in, in our economy and uh, environment. And as well as that, we have uh, we have the the Eastern Corridor uh, running from Belfast down to Rosslare and the Atlantic Economic Corridor. These are, are national strategies that we, we 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 can take advantage of. Next slide, please. Yeah, that that overall strategy is encapsulated in the map, and that that you know that sets out those points. But if you know if you look at that map in terms of energy, it also shows. Um, the potential we have um, in terms of the region, uh, we've three of the country's five cities, we've a very strong network of towns, we have um, we've our location, I mean, in a way, it's pretty the, the full country in there because energy goes beyond the region, but also in terms of our location um, nearest to, to Europe, that's very important for us in terms of Brexit and the connections in, in relation to energy. We, we have, um, you know, huge potential there with wind and sea, et cetera. So, uh, I, you know, there, there is extraordinary potential within our region and extraordinary capacity in the change that's coming in the, the settlement strategies within the region and allied to that, the growth that, that's com that, that comes with that. Next slide, please. Yeah, in, t in terms of the research itself, um, I was looking at this morning, the MPF has uh, 75 objectives, we have 300, and that reflects, um, that reflects, I think, largely um, the drilling down of strategies when you get to the, the more granular level, but also the fact that we, we had a very large consultative process and the, the democratic input to that. So now as we move on, we're moving towards the, the implementation side, which in part today's uh, presentation relates. And in looking at those 300 objectives, we, we needed to um, come up with a sensible approach to how to deliver on those. So that involves categorization and setting out a, an overall structure on how that would be monitored and implemented and implemented in an in efficient and effective way. So at our meeting with the Assembly uh, uh, in January, we put forward uh, an overall structure with, to the members, which involves uh, the establishment of an oversight from, from the elected members, the establishment of a delivery board um, in, in relation to the overall implementation of the RESIS, and then uh, uh, establishing uh, implementation program under the three headings. So uh, it's, energy will be a key component of that, and most likely under the, the, 
the green region heading. So um, topics such as the development of stakeholder forum, uh, implementation forum, you know, would, would, would come in under that from our perspective. It's true to say as well that in the last year we've had um, significant implementation to date um, that, you know, that cuts across a range of areas, engagement with the local authorities in relation to the development plan process, but also engagement with national government uh, on, on, on various projects. Um, partly uh, activities such as with the, our, our, our sister organization, Climate Action Regional Offices, through uh, engagement with local authorities there. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, moving to the focus within uh, the document itself on, on climate, cli and, uh, and climate action and energy. Firstly, I make a very important point. I go back to what the whole purpose of the RESIS is about. Um, that does, and it talks about an overall, overarching change to the way our country is, uh, it, the, the settlement and economic strategy for our country. And that, and one, when one part rela it relates to growth because of an additional million people in the country, but in another sense, it relates to how we go about our, go about the, our, our society and the delivery of, uh, of, of energy and how we, how we live. So the, the recess sets a, re, a strong framework for uh, climate resilience, talks about decarbonization throughout all, all sectors and resource efficiency. So as I say, the important point I think with the recess is firstly the, the change in the course of the country in terms of of, of, of how our, our society is, is organized and then how we can take advantage of changes within energy de delivery. Next slide, please. Yeah, that links back to uh, the National Policy Objective 55 within the MPF. And uh, we have uh, within our uh, chapter in chapter six of, of the RESIS relates to environment, and that includes uh, 11 objectives directly related to new renewable energy. Part of that is support for the development of a regional renewable energy strategy, and that, that's something that, that we will be looking at, and I think today's event is a component of that and a very important component of that. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, just to... To bring it back to the, the implementation side, um, the document itself, it, it supports a lot of the activities that are already happening in within our region. Uh, the, we have the European Wide Covenant of Mayors, which a number of our local authorities have signed up for. Uh, we're promoting leadership and uh, we've, we've highlighted best practice um, and that, 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 that will be spoken about later. If we were, you know, significant portion relates to the by economy the economy hub at Lachine and Tipperary. We've other we've other examples of best practice at the Shannon Integrated Framework Plan. And through the document itself, you know, where we strongly support renewable energy. We, we really set the you know a frame for that to happen. And you know, and identifying the best financial instruments to support renewable energy investment, which we'll hear about later in, in, in the event. So um, I leave it at that. I hope uh, that has been helpful in setting the framework for uh, the speakers later on today. So thank you very much. And I go back to the central point about it's not the isolation of, of energy as one topic. It relates to the overall change that's coming for our society and we need to adapt to that. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, for that, Kevin, um, and for for stepping in um, uh, earlier than anticipated. Um, I know the minister, I, I think, ha has arrived and is just here. But maybe before the minister, Kevin, could I just throw maybe just put one question to you, if that's okay? Um, you, you spoke about the the local authorities, and and you know we, we know the local authorities are going to be crucial, um, I suppose, in the implementation of the wider regional strategy. Um, but I'm just wondering, just from your perspective. I suppose how important do you think collaboration between the local authorities is going to be in delivering on the I suppose the renewable energy objectives as well? Uh, it would be it is very important because I mean if 
you know, if you think about the topic, the topic really doesn't relate to county boundaries. You know, it's it 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 it's broader than that. It's broader. It's broader than that in a collective sense, um, and it's it's broader than that in the national sense, and it's it's international as well. We talk about in the recess about interconnection to Europe um, as well. So it's fundamental. It's it's just not a topic that you can do deal with on an individual basis. You know. And now in saying that, you know, I pointed to some of the examples of the best practice. So that, that that does come from the local level. So it's about taking that best practice and learning from it and applying elsewhere. And, you know, we, we're, we're, we talk as well about uh, micro energy generation, et cetera. So it does work from at all levels, but it can't be, it can't, it can't be set by, by county bounds. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Kevin. I think that that that's a really important point. Look, th thanks for that, Kevin. Um, okay, well, look, I think they, the, as far as I know, I think the minister ha has joined us. So, Minister Ryan, if you're if you can, can you turn on your camera, please? Yeah, I don't know if you hopefully you can see me there or hear me there. We we can hear you at the moment, and we can't see you just yet. Just bear with me a sec. I'll sort that out. Yeah. Okay. Just bear with me a second. I'm, I have to apologise. I was all ready to go, and the firewall system in the Department of Transport was having none of it. And I don't know whether that says anything about your good selves or about our <laughs> firewall. But uh, just bear with me a second. I'll get the camera working now. Yeah, okay. Well, look, just when, when you're trying to get it all, Minister, maybe just to say um, that, you know, um, I suppose the first part, part of what we did was just kind of set the context for for the, the webinar this morning, just outlining, I suppose, the I suppose very strong ambition within the southern region to move to uh, I suppose the low carbon agenda to be one of the most uh, greenest livable regions in Europe, um, and that, that these effectively um, these ambitions emanate from the UN sustain, sustainable development goals, from the EU agenda in terms of the Green Deal, and also from the government's climate action plan. And it's just I suppose the the importance of investment in delivering on those. Um, those uh, those those key ambitions, um, and Kevin then also spoke about, I suppose, the strategy role of the regional space and economic strategy, and the elements contained in that that really focus on on renewable energy. So look, we're we're delighted that you can join us here this morning. And um, you know, as a minister with responsibility for the environment, climate, and communications, you know, you're going to have a, a crucial role to play in this regard going Thank forward. You. So look, we're, we're, Thank we're you. delighted. What I might. Well, I'm very glad to hear. What I might do is just proceed, if I can, with voice only, if, if for, for whatever reason. And I, I, again, I must apologise. It's just one of those technical gremlins. Um, yeah, but if I sir. can, I, I want to pick up on where Kevin left off there and, and maybe just go through those levels. And um, conscious that I'm, I think, going to be followed by Mary Donnelly. And, and um, I'm thrilled to listen. I look forward to listening to Mary because uh, Mary Cabinet on Tuesday uh, agreed appointment to Mary as, as our chair of our new Climate Advisory Council. I have the, the privilege of working with her uh, in her previous role within the European Commission. And um, I'm, what gives me more than confidence more than anything else is that she'll be at the helm at a critical time in a critical role. So I, I look forward to what she has to say. Um, can I set the wider context first before going those, through those levels from the very local up to the more international um the we have a really ambitious climate target it's it is what the science says we have to do and it's in line now with what the european increased ambition is um but no one should underestimate the scale of the change the scale of the challenge we will in a decade have to half our emissions we will within two in the energy sector um in my mind two at maximum three decades stop the use of fossil fuels or certainly if we are using any fossil fuels the, the carbon will have to be stored uh, underground from from any uh, combustion and and that's never been done as much best of my knowledge in any country but it is what we have to do and it is where the new economy is going it's where investment is going it's where employment will come it will give us greater security it will give us all sorts of health uh, and other benefits so it is a, a, an incredible challenge, but one that will be for the better of our country. One I think that is shared across the political spectrum. It's not just a Green Party uh, issue anymore. I think every party sees this is, is the strategically correct thing to do. Um, so 
within that target, energy is going to carry a lot of the early lifting because, um, as I was saying, we're going to have to sit a 70% renewables target uh, and could well go further. Um, there are three levels to it, as, as I see it. And firstly, starting at the home, starting at the individual, starting at the business. Um, we are in the middle of a consultation phase for the uh, microgeneration support, where a householder, if they're generating power, typically from a solar panel, photovoltaic on the roof, will be able to obviously to use that for their own needs, but also should they have any surplus uh, or at a time not have a need, then they'll be able to sell that back to help make the financing of it work. Uh, and partly what will also make this work is the price of photovoltaics, particularly has continued to fall, is continuing to fall. It's now a very economic prospect. Um, we need to extend that further. Um, we want to make sure that farmers and small businesses and rooftop solar in businesses uh, also becomes a real option. So that, and what's critical on this is um, not only can we tap into that power supply, solar will tend to have, and it will be a lot of solar, uh, there may be other wind or hydro or uh, geothermal and, and a range of other renewable power supplies that we can tap into. But uh, solar PV particularly has certain advantages, uh, one of which is that it, it, it will help balance with our variable wind supply. It, it'll help to smart, start smooth out this, this daily curve of, of demand. So, and I think critically, it won't be just business farms and householders, there's the real potential here for community engagement, community involvement, community cooperation, community cooperative generation and supply companies. Remember, Mary Donnelly introduced me, I think, a number of years ago to a company in Belgium, the uh, EcoPower, I think it was called, which, which has developed this model of uh, pooling resources to be able to make the necessary investments. And, um, and I think that is one of the real benefits of this transition is we can have a much more widely dispersed ownership and engaged model of economic activity uh, around this energy transition. Moving up then to the second tier, the next tier up, um, which is more uh, generation above uh, half megawatt and, and beyond. Um, it, obviously, the largest sector here is again both solar, particularly solar farms, and also um, wind, obviously. And we still have huge potential because we have such comparative competitive advantage in the strength of our wind resource uh, for that to provide a key role. It is constrained by both grid and by, by and by planning. We have to be sensitive to habitat and to local communities. And probably the grid constraint is now one of the biggest constraints. Um, we're seeing, seeing the cost of curtailment and constraints rising, uh, which undermines the comparative competitive advantage we have. Um, so key to some of the success and rolling out here will be addressing those grid issues, supporting air grid and ESP networks in their um, critical job, probably the most critical uh, key f obstacle or, or factor in our success or otherwise in this whole project will be the rollout and development of grids. Um, we're using now renewable energy auction systems, the first one uh, middle of last year, which was very successful. Um, we um, set ourselves on the path to meeting this 2030 target with the bids that came in. Um, it was uh, lower cost than the previous um, fixed refit price support system that we had. I expect it to continue to fall in cost as the, uh, the cost of the technology decreases and the certainty and uh, in, uh, or the um, good planning and grid timeline certainty improves. That's been that kind of difficulty I mentioned around grid and planning and, and the uncertainty around financing connected to this whole development process. Um, has been a real uh, constraint and, and a real cost. So the more we can get good planning and good grid planning done in conjunction, in conjunction with the renewables auctions, the lower the bid prices will be, the more, the more uh, competitive uh, this renewable power supply comes. Um, helping within this is that there is again a significant community element. We saw seven projects getting through the auction process uh, last year, which were community, either fully community or, or majority community owned. There are uh, community support requirements. It's two euros a megawatt, I think, uh, support for local community 
um, within the new re renewable auction requirements. I think that delivered will deliver something like four and a half million euro support for local communities uh, out of the last auction scheme. So, so, and it's uh, it's again just part of that making sure there's widespread involvement here. In my mind is the best uh, one of the key strategic things we need to get right. Um, the third tier, and I'm really just flying over the kind of the uh, big broad outline, but but just to give my sense of it, is um, is in the development of offshore power, um, particularly offshore wind. Uh, we've been working for many years now on offshore wave and tidal. There's been really good work done in in Cork, in in the Mara Centre, um, in uh, Rinneskiddy. A lot of that knowledge and expertise we'll, we'll be able to use in, in offshore, particularly floating wind. Um, the process here is as follows. We, we will um, have to introduce a new marine planning development bill. Uh, it's in already in pre-legislative scrutiny in the Dáil. I talked to the chair of the committee yesterday. He's confident they'll have their report uh, completed within the next week or so. Um, and hopefully, I find the Department of Local Government reviewing that. That will get uh, into the Baractus. It's the Taoiseach is correctly saying, and, and, and any time asked, that there are three keys, the three most important pieces of legislation for this government are the Climate Action Bill, the Marine Planning Development Bill, and the Land Development Agency Bill. So we we are top of the legislative priorities. Every effort has now been done to be delivered to to bring this marine planning legislation into into being. Um, one of the reasons we want that is because we look to the first auction. Um, for offshore wind uh, the, towards the end of this year. Um, it will be followed in the same way we're doing with the auction system on the onshore wind it, uh, and, and solar. It will be done on a regular basis so that we get a, a flow of projects, uh, so that we give that kind of certainty and, uh, and scale that allows people to make investments in, in a kind of orderly way. Uh, the first concentration will be on the Irish Sea, something like two and a half gigawatts, we hope, in the in the uh, projects, some of the seven projects that already have kind of, uh, a licensing and uh, and a lot of work done on the on the planning front. Um, it will extend though uh, into the Celtic Sea, uh, and um, and my key big vision here is that the real intent is that we also then move from that that what's fixed pylon. Uh, uh, connectivity or fixed pylon wind turbines in, in largely the kind of sandbanks areas in the Irish Sea. As we start to move into deeper waters, once you get beyond, as I understand, about 50, 60 metres, uh, floating wind will start to become the preferred option. Um, everything I'm hearing from the industry is that it is developing and, and improving at scale and in price in the same way that um, other wind uh, turbines have come down in price, so we expect it to be competitive. Uh, and the great advantage is of scale. Our sea area is ten times our land area. We have some of the strongest wind resources in the world. It's a very harsh environment, but the scale here of these turbines and the, the very large size um, means that they can survive in that environment, and it gives us the potential for developing. We've set an initial target of up to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind floating, and uh, well, 35, including the RC, and and there's no reason we couldn't go further. It is an immense project beyond compare. It's art and crush it to the times of 100, but it is um, it's absolutely where international finance is, where technology companies are investing and going, and it is one where there's real political commitment in the European Council. Um, I talked to my German, French, um, Spanish, uh, Dutch, Belgian colleagues. They're all investing in this. They all think this is the big project um, to provide a significant percentage of Europeans' power. And it has huge potential for economic development in the likes of Cork, Rosslare, Foynes, um, and other ports um, for both the maintenance and supply, for the assembly, for the construction. And indeed, in my mind, then for taking the power back in uh, again, how we how we develop the grid to 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 use this power and share this power is going to be critical. And included within that, the potential for hydrogen as a storage fuel, uh, and, and the potential for us to locate industries uh, close to the uh, landing point of either the electricity or the hydrogen uh, coming from this power supply is going to be probably the biggest economic. A driver in this country in the decades to come, and that's why the Marine Planning Development Bill is, is 
front and centre stage in, in the government's legislative programme because I think we all realise this is our economic strategy for the future. It's going to take time. Um, obviously, the, the projects of this scale, you know, don't don't happen overnight. We have to get the planning right. We have to be very sensitive to the marine habitat. Um, we have an advantage over other locations in that we've it's less uh, congested seas. We don't have the same military and other um, traffic that 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 uh, would have to be managed. We can do it in conjunction with the rolling out of marine uh, protected areas, which is a key to European policy. So. It is. It is a. I know it's very long term, but it is just starting from the home, working up to this. This is where we're going. Um, again, as I said, grid is key and, and critical to make this work. Isn't just interconnection onto the shore, but with other neighbouring islands. We'll have to work with the UK on this, uh, and with the continent. Probably one of the most important projects uh, that we have to deliver is that French interconnector uh, coming ashore. I understand potentially down near Yall and. Um, uh, with a, a converse station near Carrick Tool, I think is is being considered by by Airgrid. That gives us the potential to to share the power to to balance this whole system, and it's going to be the first of several interconnectors we're going to have to build. We have to think really big. I remember talking to Mary Donnelly about this about ten years ago, and we were thinking, well, why wouldn't we connect south to Spain, or maybe even thinking or uh, thinking that sort of scale of how we ship and share this power, and 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 in 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 this future. The southern region uh, will be the centre of of development, and um, it is it is a matter now of of us collectively organising, getting public support, getting good planning and uh, grid development right to make it happen. Uh, and that's a very real prospect, particularly with the likes of Mary Donnelly at the hub. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for, for for that intervention. And you know, there's a lot of really important aspects that that you touched on there. And um, I I understand that you're you're available to stay for a few minutes extra, just maybe take a few questions. Of course, Anne. Yes, indeed. That that that's great. Look, thanks very much for that. Um, look, I suppose I have one or two questions myself, but I there's one or two after coming in from the floor as well. So I might just put those to you first, if if that's okay. Um, one question um, from. Laura Goff is talking about, I suppose, the, that we all recognise the importance of renewable energy, the need for greater public and community support. Um, and I suppose the question is really around that the political will towards supporting really the integration of micro renewable energy generation onto the grid, um, as opposed to you know the, the large the larger connections around the large wind farms. I know you, you touched on that a little bit, Minister, but maybe you might just elaborate a little bit further. Yeah, we have a huge challenge on the grid, as I said. It's probably the key thing to getting this right. And it's both at the transmission level and also that interconnection, international level. But bringing it back down locally, um, it's also a critical issue at the distribution level. And it's going to be a real challenge, an engineering challenge. If you look at the what's likely to happen, and it's not just the renewable power generation, it's also the, if you look at the demands going to be on that distribution grid. We will switch away from burning fossil fuels in our heating systems. Um, so domestically, we're going to have to start weaning ourselves off uh, oil-fired burners, gas-fired burners, coal, uh, and other solid fuels. And um, that has to happen to meet our climate targets, to improve our health outcomes, and so on. Um, the alternative will be the development of heat pumps. The huge efficiency gain you get from the heat exchange from cold or outside air, particularly air source in my mind, and, and, the, and the inner heat, you convert that into, into hot water, which, um, which then heats your, your house. Um, but it will put a big demand on the, particularly if you have a terrace row of houses or, or apartment area, you know, how, do you, um, how do you get the distribution system to serve uh, that row of houses east with the heat pump? And, and similarly, at the same time, we are going to switch to electric vehicles. And again, let's say if you have that row of terraced house or semi-D houses, you know, typical Irish suburb, um, each with an electric vehicle at the front, which they will have in, in the very near future, uh, again, you have a big load there, a big, a big demand. Typically on that street with all that row of terraced suburban houses, uh, you probably, I think it's a 15 volt capacity constraint on the, on the pole uh, leading into the, the row of houses. So, one of the things we're going to have to do in this context, in my mind, firstly, the availability of solar PV uh, actually supports uh, 
the network in a way that because there's such a demand load going to be required on the distribution level. Um, it may also be complicated by battery and other systems. It would probably be further complemented by us to, to make this work. You're switching on and off all sorts of devices. You know, you don't need your freezer on all the time. You could regulate and manage the heat pump to operate at times when wind power supply is high or, or when uh, local solar, let's say, is available. So. Uh, the smart meters we're going to put into every house in the next three, four years will help in, in this managing of this smart grid at the distribution level. Um, it's a huge challenge for ESB networks. Um, we, uh, it, it's, it's a very significant investment. The uh, energy regulator is working with ESB networks in terms of looking at what exactly does this mean. Um, it has huge economic advantages because we're using our own power supply, and and, uh, and this is where where the future is. It, it allows us to balance not just at a local level, but also nationally, our very high level of renewables integration. We are at the very top of the uh, of the learning curve here. We're, we're we're probably the most advanced in terms of integration of renewable power into an isolated synchronized system. And, and that learning is not just in the transmission network, it's also in the distribution network. So this is not easy. This is the area of big invention. This is the center of the industrial revolution, the clean energy revolution that is taking place. And ESB and AirGrid are, 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 are gonna to have to be world, world leading uh, to make it happen. Yeah, no, you're you're right, Minister. And look, you mentioned the, the grid quite a lot there, and the expansion of the grid and grid and the the necessity for ensuring the correct connectivity and so on. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, one one key element in terms of 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 the grid is really around how the likes of AirGrid and and ESB networks, um, I suppose, engage with the community and and and, and so on in that regard. I'm just wondering, um, you know, has there been any thought in terms of a, a, I suppose a very good strategy or approach in terms of how that might happen um, over over the coming years. Oh, you're right, and, and that's been uh, you know it's been everyone involved in local government knows that particularly back in maybe five, six, seven years ago, the more the middle of the last decade, um, the whole issue about grid and it's it's still a concern. You know we have a north south interconnector which uh, has been almost 18 years now in planning and and it's still not. Uh, Going, going to construction yet. It's very extensive in, in the Midlands, northern border county region. Um, similarly, we all know, and you know, I, mean, I can recall this in, in the Midlands and down to Waterford and parts of Cork, um, there was huge issues around the potential, you know, air grid's plans in the early and middle of the last decade around developing the grid. The, they found a lot of workarounds to, to some of this issue by using existing power cables to and using smart wire technology to kind of uh, get more, uh, to carry more load on uh, on the existing wire network. I think we're starting to come to uh, to very much a, a, a the limit of what may be possible in in the in that sort of system. And it is uh, we are going to have to uh, work with communities to to see how do we how do we further improve uh, our our grid it's, and air grid has said you know they're a public company it's 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 a uh, it's public interest is their mission and their uh, and their uh, metric um they have to and and i think uh, esb and and themselves and indeed any of any companies working in this area you have we have to engage with communities in a way that's really transparent and fair and um and honest and uh, and set out all the alternatives um I think we, uh, I think what may help is a wider consultation, public consultation on the whole climate action plan, which will set it as a bottom-up project and, and not as a kind of we're telling you this is what you have to do, but but which which maybe gets some understanding for communities that in the development of the grid into an area, economic opportunity and employment comes. That this is, as come back to what I said earlier on, if I was to take that example of, of offshore wind and so on, where where will we locate industries? Well, in my mind, increasingly industries will go close. Much for, for your time, Minister. Maybe if, if, if you have time, maybe could could I put maybe one or two more quick questions to you? Do you have time? As long as Mary Donnelly isn't there, we uh, given out about being delayed, I, I no problem. Okay, well, look, maybe I'll just put one one more 
one further question to you. We, we have a number coming in, but we can see can we maybe channel those through to you later. But there's a question from from Patrick Stevens, and he's just kind of you know kind of looking at I suppose the renewable energy resources that that are needed, I suppose, in in terms of balancing the East Coast carbon footprint. And it's just a question: Can the Southern region become Ireland's carbon neutral region based on its regional resources? It's kind of a pretty pretty wide range of question, but you might just have a view on that. I think it can. Um, I had a meeting the other day with uh, cooperative, energy cooperatives on, on, um, and we were looking at Valencia. I, uh, as a, and I've often, we've often used islands as, as areas where you kind of pick an island and if you could turn that zero carbon, would that be an example for the rest? Of, and, I, and I was just thinking in relation to Valencia, when you look at what was done there, the first cable across the Atlantic, the telegram, the telegraphic cable, and um, that sense of enterprise that was there, I think it was the Knights of Glynn, whatever, locally, or they just said, let's turn our, what was, um, might have been seen as an isolated area into the, into an area rich in resources and and with full of enterprise. And um, so that, that was kind of inspiring me when we were thinking about making Valencia a hydrogen island, you know, as, as an early example of, of what's going here. I see no reason that the southern region shouldn't be world beating at this. Um, we have huge renewable resources. We have a very rich um, growing climate. Um, part of the, the renewable future will be biomass. Um, in my mind, it, we, we have to be very sensitive in that, in that it has to be part of a land use plan where we restore biodiversity, where we improve water quality, where we um, develop forms of farming that store carbon. And so we're not just going to Max up the kind of um, growth of biomass, you know, to 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 um, and and ignore water quality and biodiversity. But I believe absolutely, as part of particularly part of that land use plan, is actually critical. And included within that uh, energy, uh, includes within that the planning of of solar and wind. It's that kind of balanced development. And at the top tier of it it's actually planning rural communities and, and people at the center of that plan in terms of there's rich employment opportunities in this. You know, if we really extend forestry in a really clever way, which is close to nature, uh, continuous cover, uh, very long term in its planning, um, that's part of, of this energy future. And it's, it has to be not crowding out communities or, or overshadowing communities. It has to be with community development at its core and centre. So I think if I was saying to the Southern Regional, I, I, well, I think what you're doing, that regional planning, that's the key. It's the key, okay, well, here's where, here's the type of forestry, here's the type of farming, it's pristine water, it's magically rich in biodiversity, and it has industry. And that's, if we get that right, if we get that planning right, that level, each level of community, nature, industry, energy, water, and no nitrogen, <laughs> kind of stopping the fertilizers and pollutants, and 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 but but switching on to um, a balanced system that's absolutely doable, and it powered by both solar, wind, particularly, um, that's a very secure and a very achievable future, and southern region well placed more than anywhere else to or as much as anywhere else to to, to make it happen yeah thank you minister i think that's a really positive note note to finish up and i think that that uh, aligns very well with the ambition that we've set out in the region space and economic strategy for the region look i'd like to thank you minister for for your time here this morning it, it's been 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 very valuable thank you very much thanks Nate. Okay, well, look, uh, we move on to our, to our next speaker, and, and Minister Ryan has made reference to our next speaker quite a lot. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Mary Donnelly. Mary is a former director of renewables, energy efficiency, and innovation at DG Energy in the European Commission. Uh, she's chairperson of Renewable Energy Ireland, and as the minister said, she's been recently appointed as chair of the Climate Change Advisory Council. And I'm also happy to say that I also sit with her on the board of the Tipperary Energy Agency. So, Mary, over to you, please. Thank you very much indeed, David. And uh, can I say how much, uh, how pleased I am to be here today and to be at this event and to have the opportunity to go through uh, the 
issues and the objectives that you have already set out in your I just again say how pleased I am to be a part of this event today and how impressed I am with the papers that you have already produced. I've gone through your regional spatial and economic strategy and indeed the more recent document of your workshop report and uh, I have to say I am very impressed at both the breadth of coverage and also within that the detail that you have addressed in your documents and indeed your ambition and the most recently uttered one there that you just mentioned, David, about being a carbon neutral region. I think that's that's exactly the goal to go for, and I think it's entirely feasible within uh, the southern region. So maybe I could just start by looking at what it is we want to achieve as part of this transition. Um, let's see. Ah, yes, here we are. I, I suppose it, it always helps to put numbers on things. You know, if you're trying to lose weight, the first thing you do is look at the scales in the morning. Uh, if you're trying to, to do anything in terms of saving for uh, buying something, you're, you're looking at the numbers of how much money you've saved. And I think in this context, it's, it's very helpful to just be very clear as to what our transition is all about here in Ireland. It's about reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And our number today in Ireland is 60. And our challenge is to reduce 60 down to 30 by 2030. Not an easy journey, I would have to say. Uh, as you can see from where the emissions are coming from, we have a very large share coming out of agriculture, and that is an intrinsic part of both our economy and our society, and will be a real challenge to find both a socially and economically acceptable transition to reduce the emissions out of agriculture as we go forward. The area of transport is particularly high in Ireland. If you compare that to other parts of Europe, our transport emissions, relatively speaking, are higher. And that's in part because we have a very dispersed population. Uh, and relatively speaking, we have low, a low share of public transport. And then, of course, we also have uh, electricity generating emissions and we have heating generating emissions. And it might be just interesting to ha have a look. Now I need to go back up, and I'm not too sure how to do that. Can, can you move it back to the previous slide, Karen, please? Mary, if you just click your up button as you would normally. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Well done. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's useful to try and break down the challenge of the greenhouse gas emissions that we're going to have to reduce. And for, for today's discussion, I was just going to limit the discussion to energy. And energy, it's, it's 40 million tonnes of emissions, transport 15, heating 12, electricity 12, and these numbers are rounded because uh, to go to the detail is a little bit uh, challenging. Um, I think it's important though to understand where the emissions are coming from. If you look at transport, half of our emissions come from you and I getting into our car and driving to the shops, the supermarket, to the nearest town, to Dublin, wherever it might be. Um, <clears throat> that's 50% of our emissions. So it's very much within our control as individuals to have an impact on that number. The, the emissions for heavy duty transport, a bit more challenging, aviation even more challenging. And then if you look at heating, the issue on heating really relates to buildings. It's probably the biggest part of our heating challenge. We have rural buildings emitting 8 million and urban uh, 4. Am I reading those figures correctly? Um, but in actual fact, the real issue that we're, we're facing here is how we're going to be able to get those emissions to be reduced. And I want to talk about that as we go through, because I think heating has been one of the areas that perhaps hasn't had as much uh, attention uh, for very obvious reasons in that heat, heating tends to be an individual activity and it's less l easy to bring in large companies, large industry to invest in it, to change it, although there are mechanisms that we can use there. And then of course we have electricity, which is our power sector, which is uh, uh, also emitting greenhouse gas, em gas uh, emissions, but is probably a world leader in terms of the reductions that have taken place over the last number of years. And indeed, if I just focus for a moment on the electricity sector, the 
targets in the government plan and the objective of achieving 70 percent res e by 2030 will in actual fact save us 7 million tons of co2 which is a huge amount uh, it's it's a challenge of course but we're well in hand to achieve that it will come from a mixture of onshore wind offshore wind and solar we we know what the numbers are we pretty much know what the investment is it's about 12 billion euros that will be invested but we also will benefit from that not just from the perspective of reducing emissions but there's about 6000 maybe even as many as 9000 jobs around that rollout of moving to 70% renewable electricity by 2030 but i think there's a very important issue linked to that and that is just i use this as an illustration this is what the wind industry has prepared in terms of how they can achieve their objectives for 2030. And I think the first thing I'd like to say is that their plan is for 8,000 megawatts. And in actual fact, the 30% target will probably need 4,000. But the reason why the plan goes to eight is because if you look at the various steps along the line, you will have losses. You will have instances where uh, either planning will not be approved, finance will not happen, uh, grid connections will not be possible, uh, companies will change their policies and tactics and directions. So over the period of time, you need to plan for more than you actually expect to have in place in order to deliver it. I think the second issue, and this is very relevant, of course, for I hope most of the people listening, is what are the, the timelines involved in the steps of rolling out uh, renewable, large-scale renewable uh, energy. And of course, there are a number of administrative steps, planning and others that need to be dealt with and must be dealt with at a local level. And the extent to which these can facilitate the rollout in an efficient way, in a cost-effective way, is an important element in terms of ultimately achieving the, the objectives that we want to achieve for uh, renewable electricity. And indeed, the minister mentioned the most recent auction uh, and the results of the RES. And it's true, there are seven community projects in this, within that. And I think that's an excellent result. But it's also interesting to see what kind and where uh, the projects are that came through that auction. And I think you could safely say that it's, it's like as if they're all falling to the bottom of the, the pile. They're all ending up, well, not all of them, of course, but many of them are in your region and therefore you will be playing a key role in this context. And what's very interesting about this particular uh, map is the extent to which solar is becoming a real part of our energy system going forward in Ireland. We haven't had that until now. It's a new area for us. Of course, it's a very well established technology, but it's quite a new area for us. And its rollout uh, will be an important addition to where we're going to go. A lot of the attention on renewable energy tends to focus on electricity it's big box that's for sure but in actual fact one of the key areas that we really need to think about is what we are using in terms of heating where are we using it and for heat one of the important issues that perhaps hasn't received enough attention until now is at what temperature do we need our heat to be because as we run out uh, renewable power in the electricity system, we also need to think about how we can use renewable technologies in our heating system. And again, you see that uh, where the residential sector is the major area for using heat, heat demand obviously in our, in our buildings and our homes, uh, you see that the rural part of our society has almost 50% of our heat demand. And it's a very interesting uh, chart to look at the last one, where you see what our demand is for high temperature heat. And temperatures up to, say, 100 degrees uh, are achievable using, for example, uh, heat pumps. But when you go up to, say, 200 degrees, and when you think about the industry that's in the southern region, if you look at, say, the co-op sector, where they're using dryers, uh, as an integral part of their production process. If you look at the pharma sector, where they also have dryers, uh, the kinds of temperature demand that they have is somewhere of the region of 200 degrees. And heat pumps are not the most obvious 
um, technology to be used for that. You can use biomass, and clearly that's an area that needs and could be further development developed. And there are issues relating to how we manage to support the industry with high temperature demand to shift to renewable heat as they go forward. And that would be an issue perhaps for another day's discussion as to how and what technologies we need to roll out in order to ensure that. But at a local level, and perhaps at a, the residential level to start with, there is one area that hasn't been developed much in Ireland uh, that really does present an opportunity when you compare to other countries. And it's very much within the gift of the Southern uh, Regional Assembly to take this up as a challenge and to potentially roll it out. You already have district heating in Tralee. Uh, there's a, one also being rolled out in Tala in Dublin. But you can see from this map that most of the towns in the region actually have the opportunity for commercially rolling out district heating. You have the geothermal opportunities in the, the pink uh, globular pieces in the middle. Uh, and then you have excess heat coming from, very large amount of excess heat coming from our industrial sources. If you look over at Ohanish, for example, uh, and in the Limerick area, there is a very large supply of waste heat coming out of those systems. The, the issue though, with regard to district heating is initially one of understanding that yes, this is a technology op option that is available, it is proven, and it can deliver results. It is, however, an infrastructure rollout. So it, it's not possible for an individual to wake up one morning and say, I want district heating, because it cannot be done at an individual level. It can only be done at a collective level, and it's in this context that the local authorities are hugely important in terms of leading the way one, in explaining to people what district heating is, and secondly, providing for the infrastructure rollout as part of the development plans. And this is, this is one of the areas that is, I would say, becoming quite urgent, because as with any infrastructure rollout, it takes time. It takes time to understand the issue, it takes time to do the costings, it takes time to do the planning preparation, it takes time to do uh, you know, the selection of who's actually going to do the rollout, it takes time, obviously, for people to understand what it is and agree to use it in their homes. So the process of actually developing the district heating system is not a short activity, and it is one that is becoming quite urgent within the Irish context because it will be almost impossible for us to uh, decarbonize our heating system unless we use these kind of technologies that are very prevalent. If you look at places like Sweden, Finland, Denmark, uh, you know, Poland, a lot of the member states have this, and it's it's a really key area in terms of rolling out uh, decarbonized teaching. And in that context, of course, the the most important resource for district teaching is what we call waste heat opportunities. And we use the word waste, it perhaps is a bit pejorative as a comment, but it is heat that would otherwise just be sent into the atmosphere or, or sent into our rivers or indeed sent into the sea as the case may be. We all know that Ireland is a major centre for data centres. We know that data centres use a lot of power and generate a lot of heat and they are becoming more and more a source of energy into the system. In fact, this is what the basis for the uh, district heating system in Tala the power, the heat is going to come from the data center. It's low grade heat. It will be upgraded through a heat pump system and be made available then to people to use in their houses. So what, what this really means is that in terms of planning, the decarbonization of our heating system, including at the residential level, it means it has to be an integral part of our industrial policy. They cannot be dealt with as separate issues. The rollout of industry, the rollout of residential and the interconnection between the two of them, particularly in the heat context, is one that is an integral part of how we're going to achieve our objectives for uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. And then I'm going to very briefly just touch on transport. Uh, clearly, in the government plan, we have a rollout of um, 900,000 electric vehicles. That has the potential to save us 3 million tonnes of CO2. But again, 
Uh, it's slow. It's starting to take off. Uh, there are barriers. There are barriers in terms of cost, capital cost to purchase these cars. There are barriers in terms of range anxiety. Will I be able to charge my car? Have we got enough publicly accessible uh, charging points? Um, is there a second-hand market for these cars? Because we all know that the second-hand market for cars is a pretty big part of the car market in Ireland. And until we get into the cycle of second-hand cars, it may be a little bit difficult to move forward as speedily as we would like in this area. But perhaps one of the areas that I'd like to come back on, and the Minister touched on this as well, and I have to say it's one of my own hobby horse points, and that is people power. Uh, and I really do believe that this energy transition that we're going through is about energy democracy. It's about allowing individuals to participate in the transition. In the end of the, tr the transition will only happen if it's done by people for people. And part of that process is really incumbent on authorities at all levels, European, national, regional, local level, to facilitate individuals to take their part in this transition. And there's a few maybe basic, basic tenants here that I think could help and support individuals becoming active in the energy transition. I think the first, the first issue is sharing knowledge and giving people a tool that they can work with. I suspect, and I, maybe I could ask the audience, would you be able to tell me what your own personal consumption of kilowatt hours of energy is every year? And just as an indicator, let me give you the, the average figures for Ireland. On average, a household will use 4,000 kilowatt hours a year for electricity. They will use 11,000 for heating and about 10, depending obviously where they are, 1,000 for transport. So the average household in Ireland is using 25,000 kilowatt hours of energy a year across the energy services of heating, transport and power. Once you have that number, then you're in a position to do something about it. But I fear that there are very few people who have a metric that allows them to use as a guide as to how they can change and reduce their energy consumption. And of course, the follow on from that then is their greenhouse gas emission. There's a small app that you can get, you can punch in your local, your own individual numbers and it's will convert it not just to kilowatts, but also to uh, emissions. But I, I just think that if people had a tool like that, it allows them to start the process of saying, okay, there's something I need to do with this number, can I get my number down? I think the second issue then is on technologies. And um, there are technologies for generation and there are technologies for consumption. Um, on the generation side, uh, we talk about heat pumps and in the, the Climate and Action Plan, uh, heat pumps, we're talking about rolling out 600,000 heat pumps. You can't do it today, but if you were in a position to go down to your local pub and ask five people, what does a heat pump look like? How many of them would be able to tell you what a heat pump looks like? And this is a technology that we have built into as a pivotal part of our uh, emission reduction going forward. And very few people in Ireland have actually seen a heat pump, much less understand how it operates. So understanding the technology, seeing it, being familiar with it, is a key part of, um, I, I believe, allowing people to participate in this transition. Uh, I shouldn't say this perhaps, but I will. Uh, I, I regret greatly that uh, the series that RTE did, Room to Improve, with Dermot Bannon, did wonderful programs on the retrofit of houses and never once showed a heat pump as part of that retrofit. Uh, what a lost opportunity. And hopefully if there's another um, series produced, they might be able to change that. Of course, the second part of technologies available to people is all about energy efficiency. And I'm not going to go through that in too much detail because I'm sure Laura will deal with that when she comes to her presentation. But energy efficient, efficiency, retrofit of our buildings, reducing uh, the energy and the emissions that we use in our home while still having comfort 
and hopefully even better air quality is a key target of rolling out that whole approach. And there is one very important area. And if you look at your own role, and I'm sure you do this, and certainly as you look across Europe, the role of the local authority in being, in terms of being a trusted partner and in giving reinsurance to people of the direction of travel for this transition is a hugely important element. Uh, local authorities have huge trust amongst their populations and they can provide uh, uh, the expertise and give the reassurance to people that yes, you can go forward, yes, you can make these investments, yes, it will give you a positive return. Um, the Minister mentioned one of the areas that uh, I had shown him some years ago and I'd just like to mention it. In Flanders, which is the northern part of uh, Belgium, they rolled out uh, solar panels uh, across the roofs, not just of the houses, but indeed all of the factories, the barns, generated power, brought those consumers together into what they call Resco-op, it's a community power company, and they now have one million consumers generating the power and using the power that they generate. It's a local power generation centre. It's, it's really very interesting. And they are moving forward on things that the Minister also mentioned about smart meters. I, I don't have a slide of it now, but one of the key issues as we go forward and gradually shift from fossil fuels to what we hope will be green electricity is that we flatten the demand for, for electricity during the day. And this can be done using demand response, provided we have the tools, the smart meters and the tariffs that make it economically interesting and financially viable for people to use those and to make it interesting for themselves. So the whole participation of individuals themselves doing their own piece, it might be small, but when you add it together, it becomes a very real part of the energy transition and allows people to take ownership of it. And just as a final comment on that, I think it is important maybe just to draw the attention to the public consultation on the microgeneration support scheme. The Minister mentioned that as well. Uh, I think this is a hugely important consultation. It's still open for, I think, about a week. Um, a number of issues that I think this consultation brings to the fore. There is no doubt at all that microgeneration will be a huge element going forward in our world and in our lives. When you think about it, we have a roof on our houses, we have a roof on our schools, our hospitals, our shops, our businesses and at the moment its function is to stop the rain getting into the house. As the cost of solar PV reduces and it is now very low, progressively those spaces will be used to generate power using solar PV more and more. You look at places, if I, if I look at Germany, 50% of the uh, Electricity, renewable electricity produced in Germany comes from solar PV, of which the largest share comes from farms and barns. If you look at Portugal, for example, in Portugal, you can go to IKEA on a Saturday morning, you can buy four panels, put them on your roof, plug it in, and you start to produce for yourself and send it into the grid. There is no precursor requirement, there's no license required, there's no authorization. You simply send an email to your supplier and say, I'm doing it. If I look at Denmark, they have the largest solar PV park in the world, providing power and hot water into their district heating system. So as a technology, it's, it's small, it's very manageable, it's less intrusive uh, than other technologies, it's very easy and very cheap to roll out. So for me, this public consultation is hugely important in order to ensure that it doesn't limit the possibilities. It doesn't exclude individuals or groups or communities from becoming really active in the energy transition and playing their part. So having said that about the consultation, uh, I'm going to finish now and thank you very much indeed for your attention. And I look forward to the comments and to the, the future rollout of the implementation plan that you've already mentioned, uh, David, in your introduction. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Mary. Um, thanks very much for that. And, you know, very, very in, in, insightful um, uh, as usual.
Um, I know we're running a little bit behind time, but look, if maybe I might just just pose one question to you, if, if that's okay. Um, look, I, I suppose you touched on a whole range of things there, and I suppose at one level we could nearly have a full seminar touching on all of the the areas that that you you addressed. Like I was, was particularly interested in the piece you, you spoke about around the district heating systems and the roles that the local authorities would play, and maybe that's a question we could put to Joe McGrath later, who's Joe's coming on after you. And um, you know, very interested in the whole concept around, I suppose, the ease of access to the grid, the micro-generation, but particularly interested, I suppose, around the people power. And to me, that, that I suppose, cuts across a number of different things in terms of um, kind of communication, awareness, understanding, and so on. And, and you mentioned the the um, Room to Improve project or program that, you know, the people didn't get to see the heat pump. So I suppose with that in mind, I'm just wondering, is there, if you like, maybe a quick win or something that needs to be done to get that quick win, if that's possible, to kind of get people's mindset changed towards this, this whole area around renewables and so on? Well, I, I, as I say, <clears throat> I think having some sort of a metric is very useful because uh, there is an enthusiasm in Ireland to support climate change and actions. Uh, and oftentimes when I talk to people and they say, yes, yes, we really must do, and I'm very keen, and I, I recycle much more now than I used to. And, and that's very good. But of course, that's something that they feel they can do at home, in their kitchen, whatever. But it's so much wider. But most people don't have any clue as to how they can do it. Uh, and that's why I think the metric is useful, because I think if you have a number, then you can say, well, you know, maybe I could tweak it and drop it by 500 or whatever. And that will lead the curious then to start finding out how can I do it? Because it's not intuitive that you would start investigating how you can reduce your energy consumption just because of a good idea. I think if you have a number, that it becomes a useful thing. So it's, it's a very simple little uh, tool that allows people to, okay, build on that knowledge and expertise. It's also very important, I believe, to have a trusted source in terms of information because that's where people really fall. You know, they say, yes, I'd like to do it, but you know, it's too expensive, it's gonna to cost too much. So I think being able to explain to people what it costs, and, and hopefully this is, this is one of the discussions for later on, uh, when we were in Brussels, we analyzed it quite a bit. The retrofit rollout of itself, about 15% of the cost ultimately is down to the energy efficiency part. I mean, it's obvious if you're going to open up the envelope of a building, you're going to upgrade your kitchen, you're going to probably redo your bathroom, all of this. But the actual energy efficiency part is only about 15%. Uh, but of course, you need the other parts as an incentive for people to do it. But explaining that to people, explaining what the options are uh, and what the finances are, uh, I think is hugely important. So knowledge really is the key part. No, I, I, I think you're right. I, I agree with you there fully. Um, and that was a very interesting question you posed was all about, do we know what, you know, what, what energy usage we have over the course of the year? I suppose I'm one of the lucky ones in that I do have a heat pump in my house, um, but I still don't, haven't done the calculations to know, you know, what, what, what my ener energy usage is. Look, Mary, thanks very much for, for your input. Really, 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 really interesting. Okay, well, look, we'll move on to, to our next speaker. Um, to Joe McGrath. Joe is the Chief Executive of Tipperary County Council. Joe, can you turn on your camera? Thanks very much, Joe. Um, and look, Tipperary, I suppose, is very active in, the, in this in this whole area. It has received a number of awards, reward, awards in terms of um, its renewable energy projects. It's, it's involved very much in renewable energy generation. So, Joe, I think you're very well placed to speak on the topic. So, over to you. Uh, good morning, David. Just checking that you can you can both hear me and see me. Yeah, that's, that's perfect, Joe. Yeah. Great, great stuff. Well, good morning to you and look, thanks to you and good, good morning to all the participants as well. Very interesting discussion uh, so far on this uh, webinar and look, I'm delighted um, to be here and to get this opportunity um, to um, say a few words about the work of local authorities, but obviously I'm, I'm focusing very much on the work of Tipperary County Council, although any of my colleagues, I suppose, could come on here this morning in the southern region and predict her and tell their story. I think it's a good story to tell. Um, I suppose we have been fortunate in Tipperary in a number of ways. We've been fortunate, and a number of speakers have made reference to the community and individual leadership. And we've had that in quite quite amounts here in Tipperary. There's been a lot of community leadership and a lot of individuals who are very driven by this whole agenda. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that from Greg Allen of Community Power later on in the webinar. But also, I think, to acknowledge that we've had a very, very active 
uh, a very supportive Tipperary Energy Agency, um, which has worked very, very closely with Tipperary County Council and the community in bringing projects forward. And also, I think I'd have to acknowledge the, the role and attitude um, of the elected members of Tipperary County Council because they have backed us when we need to go and make investment in the whole energy area. They have backed us and they certainly um, uh, have been slow to do that. Moving to the first slide and I suppose the question about renewable energy and the role of the local authority and how we can support a transition to a low carbon economy. The, the theme of my presentation is suppose there are four key themes there, the, the strategic planning and partnership. There's the whole question of the energy transition and leading by example. And I want to emphasize when I talk about leading by example, I'm not just referring to Tipperary County Council, I'm referring to a broad range of community and agencies here in the county. Uh, and I want to look at the investment in infrastructure, give some examples of some investments we've made in, in Tipperary. And finally, just to speak a little bit about our ambition for the future, I'm focusing on two projects that we're involved with, which we hope will take us into to the future in this, in this particular area. Looking at Tipperary over the past 20 years, I suppose we did get into this space in energy renewable at an early stage, and we understood the benefits, I think, of, of making that transition. Uh, one point I want to make, and it's been made by Mary, and indeed I think by the Minister as well, is the importance of rural areas and the importance of rural area participation in, in, in this whole area. You know, we have uh, well-known projects, they've gotten quite a lot of attention um, at local and national media, the Temple Derry Wind Farm, and the Clock Jordan Eco Village, and they have been developed in the heart of, of rural areas. And uh, this is particularly important in a county like Tipperary, where there's almost a 50 50 split between people living in urban areas and rural areas. There's also the issue about uh, the local economic benefit, apart from the environmental and climate action benefits, but the local economic benefits. And we've seen, for example, how the nat National Retrofit Program can deliver jobs. Um, and we can also see how rural areas themselves are contributing towards the national energy and, and making their contribution towards achieving the targets. In terms of the first team, the strategic planning and the partnership, um, as I said, Tiberi has been in this area. In fact, we, we, we've been in this area for about, for about 20 years, but back in 2014, there was a fairly significant shift in the whole restructuring of Tipperary in terms of local authority. Prior to 2014, there was you know, 10 local authorities in Tiberi. There's now a single local authority. And the most significant part of that was a merger between the North and South Tipperary County Councils. And I suppose that gave us an opportunity to look at the work that had been done prior to that and to spell out, if you like, a strategy for the future. The Renewable Energy Strategy, um, which was uh, prepared in 2016, was actually the first countywide planning document prepared by the new council. And I suppose it was a natural progression from us from the Covenant of Mayors. Uh, and we also saw it as setting out a statement in terms of our contribution towards renewable energy targets. The, the, the strategy itself, I think, built on some of the strengths of the county, um, a fairly strong, robust uh, electricity infrastructure, skills and partnership that are in the county, and that grew over the number of years, and some of our partners include the Tipperary Energy Agency, uh, the Limerick Institute of Technology, low communities, uh, community power, and the, the Tipperary Energy Community Co-op, and indeed there are other partners in some of our projects. I suppose another positive that developed for the county um, over the years was the community and local attitude to renewable projects and renewable energy projects and to infrastructure projects. And I'm not, I'm not saying or um, referencing in any way that there's consensus at all times in relation to these projects that there isn't there. They do tend to get a lot of interest, but bear in mind that the first, one of the largest, I think it was the largest at the time, wind farm, that was constructed in the country in a site near Lachine, and I'll speak about that later on, that's near Thorless. Um, that was constructed nearly 20 years ago, uh, and it has been there, and there has been, I think, a key part of that has been a community benefit scheme. So that did, I think, help towards the, the local attitude, and even did our own attitude towards renewable energy projects. Tipperary, I suppose, uh, is uh, now the, the fourth largest producer, uh, producer of renewable energy in the country. We have over 300 wind turbines in the county and 15 uh, commercial scale solar farms either permitted or going through the process of planning. In terms of the partnerships and following on from, from the Renewable Energy Strategy in 2017, we um, prepared a Sustainable Energy Action Plan um, and that really spelled out a, a series of 32 actions around areas such as planning, agriculture, uh, residential, commercial sector, and local authority itself. 
and these are actions set to uh, achieve our CO2 target commitment. The strategy itself and the uh, action plan is overseen by a group known as Sustainable TIP, and that draws membership from Tipperary County Council from Tiagusk, from the LIT, the Tipperary Energy Agency, and uh, a very vital role played by the North and South Tipperary Development Companies. And it provides, I suppose, apart from overseeing the various actions, it provides a very valuable forum for exchange of ideas and information. In terms of making the energy transition and leading by example, and again, emphasize it's, it's about leading by example within the community as much as the local authority. Um, and more recently, I suppose, Project Ireland 2040 and the Climate Action Plan have set the context for local authorities to lead in the area in terms of providing strategic uh, direction through our planning process. And one of the key areas of that is the county development plan itself. Here in Tipperary, we just commenced the review of our county development plan, and this is going to form a very, very uh, large part of, um, of the, the, the plan itself and indeed of the engagement and discussion in the plan. Um, I think within the county, whether it's the community or the local authority, the Tipperary Energy Agency or indeed others, I think is true to reflect that we are conscious of our role in leading by example. I mentioned already the support of the elected members and we have set some ambitious targets locally and, and hopefully um, our ambition will be matched by investment uh, in achieving those targets. I also mentioned that we had moved into the uh, renewable energy space about 20 years ago. There was an energy management committee set up between the former North and South Tipperary County Council, and that uh, that became known as the Climate Action and Energy Committee, which is in place nowadays under, under Tipperary County Council and working with all of our partners that I mentioned before. And within the local authority itself, working the teams working internally, um, we have Climate Action, we, we'd like to think, I suppose, at the centre of all our planning processes, uh, right across the various services we provide, such as roads, transportation, uh, environmental, and so on. And the evidence base for all our work is provided through uh, energy audits. Just in terms of investments and a few examples of investments, Mary mentioned about heat and the importance of heat. And one of the areas we looked at uh, was heat and investment in renewable heat in particular. Uh, in terms of delivery to date, the council would have invested in 25 at renewable energy infrastructure projects, and that's resulted in a 39% energy improvement. Um, one of the areas we looked at, of course, was the renewable energy, the whole heat, um, and how we could improve on that. And the first natural area to look at was our leisure centers, our swimming pools, our gyms. They're all hungry for heat and all generate a very significant amount, amount at high demand for heat. Uh, and this was a key area, I suppose, in recording a significant difference in reliance and reducing our reliance on fossil fuel uh, and also generating some financial savings. We put an investment, uh, and when I sp speak about our investments, all of them are co-funded, whether it's SEAI, whether it's department, whether it's interreg, whatever EU, whatever source they come from. But we replaced uh, fuel boilers with you know, biomass and leisure centers in uh, Nina, Thurles and Ross Gray. And 95% of the heat now generated by, by renewable energy technologies with about a 70% reduction in LPG and kerosene across the organization. Uh, the photo in this slide is of the Nina Leisure Center and Town Park, and that's one of our demonstrator areas. The um, reference is made to the heat demand mapping, and we accept there's, there's, there's a lot of work to do in that area, but our Climate Change Committee has been looking at that in some of our main towns and to look at the opportunity for partnership in uh, district heating. Speak, staying with investment, looking at the investment in renewable electricity, um, and much has been mentioned about solar PV. We're well, back in 2014, Tipperary County Council, working with the Tipperary Energy Agency, um, set about a project which involved the installation of over uh, 800 PV solar panels across nine local authority buildings, for example, our civic offices, fire stations, libraries, and leisure centres. Interestingly, at the time, I know things have moved on since, but at that time, that project alone increase Ireland's total solar PV capacity by 44%. Uh, investment over 326,000 euro, 50% of that was grant aid through Better Energy Community. Project payback time was about seven years um, and a uh, billion on this, we've more than doubled, recently more than doubled our solar capacity, uh, which, which leads me into our next uh, uh, example, which is investment in community development and energy generation. The community uh, virtual power plant is that's it's an interreg funded European project undertaken by uh, Tipperary County Council, the Energy Agency and Community Power. 
I suppose there were at least two objectives here. Firstly, to show how the community groups can set up their own um, community-based virtual power stations. And secondly, to raise the whole awareness. Um, I'm not going to go too much further into this because a speaker coming after me, Greg Allen from Community Power, I think is going to speak a little bit more about that. So I might just, just defer that to, to, to Greg in relation to that. Just to mention the capital cost of the project, about 240,000 euro into Reg 60% and, and Tipperary County Council 40%. In terms of education and awareness and um, the need to work with the agriculture, we saw the figures that Mary put up there in terms of uh, the various contributions by the various sectors. And agriculture is a huge contributor in terms of the overall uh, debate here. But one of the uh, needs that was highlighted by our elected members was the need for direct engagement with the agriculture sector with farmers at a local level. And out of that came an idea of the Energy in Agriculture Conference. The inaugural conference was held in uh, 2016. And it's hosted in Gertine College, and it's a very appropriate location. It's a third level agricultural college. Uh, it's well known for its innovation in energy, and it's also deployed itself a suite of renewable energy uh, efficiency technologies. Uh, this was a partnership between the council, um, the energy agency, Chagas IFA, Gertine, Col Gertine uh, College, and others. And I think one of the key aspects of this, and one of the things making it a success, was the fact it wasn't just about um, conference mode in terms of speaking, a range of speakers, which was helpful, obviously, in terms of ex the expertise they brought, but also in terms of practical demonstrations of technologies, the opportunity for those attending to actually interact directly with people who were involved behind these technologies, that proved to be very successful. And in fact, it quickly became the largest uh, energy event for farming community uh, in the country. Uh, I'd say that Gertine College got a, got a mention out of it. They, they were awarded the SEI award for the energy team of the year in uh, 2018. Obviously, 2020, that had to be postponed due to the COVID situation. We're looking at running this again this year, probably as a virtual event, but we're looking to, but it's certainly one that we see ourselves in for the long haul. And certainly I think it has, the, the feedback on the event has been good. In terms of research and training and looking at that, when you become involved in projects and when you become involved in trying to bring the whole renewable energy climate action into developing of plans and that it does develop, I think, an expertise uh, and an interest and a hunger within the organization. And we've been involved in a number of research and training projects with our partners. Uh, one of them, just to mention, one of them was a pilot school training program, which was working with transitioning your students about developing energy aud audits in their own school. Uh, and we've also been involved our own staff in planning here uh, in the council, of course, or research on community investment in large scale renewable energy developments, and that paper was published as part as a reference document in the draft uh, wind energy guidelines. Just turning out to two projects on our ambition for the future, this is a photograph, aerial photograph of the National Bioeconomy Campus at Lachine. This was a former uh, lead zinc mine owned by uh, international company Vedanta. It closed in 2015. Obviously, a uh, loss of considerable number of jobs and a task force was established to look at possible future uses for the site. The site itself is about a thousand acres. It's a large site. Uh, you can see there a uh, wind farm on that site. That was in place, it has to be said, before the closure. Um, but the task force set about its business and it, it really came across the whole area of bioeconomy and the opportunity of bioeconomy. Bear in mind, this site was fully serviced in terms of infrastructure, in terms of roads, in terms of energy, in terms of water in particular. Uh, it was fully serviced uh, for all of those. And the site itself was designated by the European Union as a model, model demonstrator site in 2016. It was fortunate, I suppose, in getting um, uh, two significant announcements, the Agricom Way project funded by the EU in 2017, and that was followed by an investment by Enterprise Ireland of, of over 4.6 million in the Irish Bioeconomy Foundation. One of the features, as you can see there from the photograph uh, of the uh, campus is, a third, is the, the presence of a 30 wind uh, turbine. And uh, this was uh, in the national news, I suppose, last year. Um, you probably are aware that Facebook has an agreement with Brookfield Energy um, for this wind farm and to deliver on it as part of an international agreement and, and to deliver on its commitments as well. And uh, this relates to the um, uh, data centre uh, in Clanny and County Meath. Ireland, I suppose, has some very, very ambitious targets in renewable energy, and those have been referenced earlier in earlier presentations. 
And but there is no doubt that sites like Lachine can make um, and can assist us to get uh, towards those targets. Just uh, nearing the end, and, and the second project, just in terms of looking to the future, we're looking at the development of a center of excellence, um, building on the experience, I suppose, building on the knowledge we have. Um, and this project is a project that's been submitted for URDF funding. Partners are on it are ourselves, the um, Energy Agency, LIT, North Tipperary Development Company, Community Power, and Sigga Hydro, which is a private company. Uh, interestingly, and I think just to link this back into the host of this conference, uh, this project is identified in the Southern Regional Spatial Economic Strategy uh, as a specific objective. And um, it's, it's hoped that this will bring us uh, together in a particular center, Center of Excellence Energy Professionals and Researchers in demonstrator building, and um, I suppose be, be a center for innovation as well. And hopefully that's one that we can deliver through, through URDF support in the future. So I'm going to conclude with uh, just briefly reminding ourselves what the Climate Action Plan said in relation to local authorities' uh, contribution. Local authorities occupy a pivotal role in the, their respective communities and can act to demonstrate public sector leadership and climate action in their areas, as well as key mobilizers of action at a local and community level. And I think it's fair to say, obviously, I've concentrated on Tipperary, but I think the local authority sector itself is very much up for uh, this agenda and for making progress, for working with communities, for working with, with, with state agencies, and however we need to work with in order to achieve our national targets. Um, and in terms of uh, the wider local authority input, uh, just refer you uh, to a very, very good report that was published a year ago, it was published in January 2020 by the Local Government Management Agency. It, it's a profile of local government climate action in Ireland. And it has very specific reference there to renewable energy as well. That's available on the LGMA website if, if anyone's interested, but it gives you some details and facts and figures in relation to what the overall sector uh, has been doing today. So look, um, uh, David, I'll, con I'll conclude with that. And again, look, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to say a few words uh, and uh, to make a contribution. Uh, thanks very much, Joe. And look, I, I think it's obvious that Tipperary County Council is definitely fulfilling that that requirement in terms of demonstrating the leadership role is, has a real firm commitment um, to this this whole area. And I suppose it's demonstrating how the that comparative advantage in renewables can actually be brought to fruition um, in a county, you know, with 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 huge commitment and and with buy-in uh, across the sector. And look, it's obvious that local authorities have a I suppose a very important role to play in this across across not only the region but 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 the country in general. Maybe just one question, Joe, before we move on, because I know we're, we're running a little bit behind time. But it just I suppose in terms of that that leadership role that that that's necessary and required and um. I suppose, how do you see or how would you, you facilitate or see the importance of that leadership role in terms of collaborating across local authorities and um, to bring that regional ambition forward? You know, because not every local authority is at the same stage. And you know, and what maybe what might be necessary to, I suppose, to assist, or what are the key points that local authorities need to look out for to help them on that journey, if you know what I mean? I, I do indeed, uh, David. I think I think um the leadership at local level, political leadership is very important at a local level, just to mention that. But obviously leadership from senior management in local authorities, within staff itself, um, and our staff really, to be fair to them, in, in planning and in environment have been very, very proactive in working with the energy agency and in working on the ground. And it's really about, you know, we probably can't get feet on the ground at the present time, but you know what I mean by getting out there and getting, getting into that space. In terms of, I think you're referring to, and mentions being made, that local authorities are going to have to work together to deliver on the targets. We have a long history, you know, local authorities are currently working together on a whole range of projects. And I think you're aware of this yourself and, and some of them are mentioned in the recess itself. Uh, we work um, in, uh, we've worked in energy projects uh, with, with uh, adjoining local authorities. We work uh, on tourism projects. We work on infrastructure projects. There are very, there are very few areas now that we, we don't work in together on. So I think the collaboration, the processes and above all, David, the will is there to do that. And we have seen the benefits is that we, there are certain things we'd like to achieve in Tipperary. We know we can't achieve them ourselves. We understand the importance of working with our partners, whether it's in the Southeast or the Midwest in getting certain things done. So there is a very, very good culture of working together there already. I don't think that's going to be a hard nut to crack, to be honest. 
Great. Thanks very much, Joe. And look, I think you're right. I think that that's crucially important and it's, it's important to build on that on that, that collaboration going forward. OK, well, look, we might move on to our, our, our next um, uh, section in, in, in the seminar. And I suppose this is our, our final section where we're looking at, I suppose, a number of, of case studies. So we have three, three, three presenters here. So the first one is Laura Houston. Laura is the co-founder of Sustainability Works, um, a consultancy firm that works with public and private businesses to accelerate Ireland's shift to the low carbon economy. And Laura has done some work with us um, through the Fires Paul project um, uh, over the last 18 months. So I'll hand over to Laura. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, as David mentioned, we were, myself and my colleague, Aidan O'Hora, um, supported the Southern Regional Assembly on the Fire Spot project through doing a bit of thinking about what could a renewable energy investment forum for the Southern region look like, and then engaging with stakeholders to get feedback and their views on, you know, whether there was really a need for such a forum or whether there are enough forums already. Um, and, you know, really was there a need for this type of a public-private a forum that would share knowledge and encourage collaboration and ultimately you know and this is very much something that we got back from the stakeholders not be just a, a talking shop but very much be there to drive action um, and support collaboration and projects to actually come through and um, so it was great being part of that and great seeing today happen and you know we're looking forward to hearing um, the feedback from today and um, to see whether people think this is something that they'd be interested in seeing continue so we've spoken a lot already about the ambition um, and we've spoken at, at like a global level, at an EU level, at an Irish level, and then about the policy and the policy measures that are being put to, in place nationally and regionally to really drive action on the ground across, right across renewable electricity, heat and transport. Um, but ultimately, you know, the question comes down to it, and David touched on this at the start, you know, pub, there's not enough public money in any country to deliver what we need to do to meet our climate action targets. So where's the money gonna come from? And the, the answer to that is there's no new magic source of money. It's still the same sources of funding as there ever were. So public finances coming through in capital infrastructure budgets or in subsidies or grants, um, debt being provided by banks or by the capital markets or other finance providers, and then investors, whether public or private, and whether institutional investors or, or retail investors. So I suppose that makes us think, you know, where if, if it's still the same sort of finance, then where do we start talking about innovative finance mechanisms? And what do local authorities and, and regional governments have to do with any of this? Um, and really that was what the Firespile project has been all about. It's been about investigating um, how can you boost renewable energy investment across the partner countries that were involved really by sharing knowledge and case studies of different um, projects that have actually been implemented using innovative finance mechanisms in the partner countries. And so the Southern Regional Assembly was a partner and there was local government or local energy agencies from five other countries. Um, and really what came out of that was, um, and I, I suppose like any interreg project, you know, the purpose of this is to share, um, is to drive and develop policy development through sharing best practices from other countries. And so every country involved had to come up with 15 case studies from their region um, and put them forward as, listen, these are really good examples of, of, of what we've done here. And um, that meant that there was this, there is this big um, case book of 90 case studies um, kind of setting out different, um, different options and mechanisms. And really, when you look at them all, you can divide them into the themes that we've set out here on the right. Um, so really, a lot of the, the projects that were particularly, these are the themes that are relevant from an Irish perspective. And a lot of the, the mechanisms that were discussed were things around, you know, enabling citizen participation, in either development-led, developer-led or community-led projects. And that's really about investment and ownership of projects. Um, there were a number of projects around local authorities entering into innovative finance mechanisms like energy procure procurement contracts um, or um, with ESCOs or energy efficiency funds um, and looking at how that was all structured and how that worked out in the end. Or similarly, local authorities entering into power purchase agreements with renewable energy projects 
to really support the financing and development of additional renewable energy generation onto, on, uh, onto the grid. And um, another area was really, and this is nearly in the context of local authorities and their role as developing e in economic development, but really making the links between these large corporates like Facebook and Amazon that are looking for renewable energy source power because they have set at their corporate level these really ambitious um, carbon neutral targets. And so they're looking to, um, to go to regions like anywhere in the world that will be able to provide them with local renewable energy source power um, and you know the role of local authorities in kind of matchmaking or engaging and, and helping both sides. And corporate PPAs, I suppose, corporate power purchase agreements, you know, they're a really important financing mechanism because it's a way that projects can de get developed outside of the renewable energy support scheme and auction scheme that Minister Ryan referred to earlier. And really it's, it's large corporates that are putting forward the money that will ultimately support getting these projects built. And there are a number of other innovative projects and themes that came across. And really a lot of those were revolved around, and I think you can actually see a lot of those types of projects in the types of projects that um, Joe McGrath was just speaking through there earlier, but like local authorities getting involved to help de-risk um, projects that might be at an earlier stage of maturity in terms of technology development or just an early stage of development generally. And you know, the role of local authorities there in terms of de-risking projects to enable them to proceed across micro-generation or accessing um, national or EU sports being a conduit there and other innovative projects. And generally there was a link to local government involved in the case studies or else to um, to national government. There was even green bonds issued by Latvia to fund their renewable energy projects in one case. So today we're gonna to focus in just on one of those themes because you could literally do a whole seminar and I suppose that's, that's the thinking behind the need for a renewable energy investment forum that you could do whole seminars on every single one of these topics um, and more. But really today we're gonna to focus in on system participation or investment in renewable electricity projects specifically. So specifically actually wind and solar. So Mary, I'm not gonna be talking today. <clears throat> I, I usually talk to Mary about residential retrofit finance um, and I'm always happy to talk about that, but I'm not talking about that today. Um, so I suppose just stepping back and, and thinking about, okay, how are wind and solar projects in Ireland financed? at present, so why do we need any innovative finance here? There's two main sources of capital, equity and debt. Generally, you can get um, bank debt or project finance debt, it's called, for up to between 70 to 80% of the cost of a project. And then the balance is equity that's put in by the owners or developers of the project. Um, the, the, you know, the cost of debt on a renewable energy project has come down over the last number of years. I suppose in line with declining interest rates, but also in line with the fact that banks really understand renewable energy now and really understand how to finance these projects and are comfortable with wind or solar projections, etc. Um, and it's also very much helped by the fact that there is the backing of the renewable energy support scheme for these projects. But debt is, is you know, gen generally would come in, the last time I looked at around 3%, annual return, so the cost of the debt would be around 3% per annum, um, and the return you'd expect on an equity ownership of a project. So if you're a pension fund that's buying into a project, once it's being decommissioned and de-risked, you'd be talking about that you'd be expecting six to 7% annual return in that project. Um, and basically, these are so easy. There is nothing innovative about any of that. It probably was innovative 15 years ago. And even if you look at Poland put forward case studies as part of Firespall, and they still need EU funds to get some of their basic small wind and solar projects off the ground because they're just not used to it. Um, but in Ireland, <clears throat> it's very easy, excuse me, <clears throat> to raise money for a wind or solar project. That is not your issue because these are really, really attractive investment opportunities, either for lenders or for in particular institutional investors. And when I talk about institutional investors, I mean the lot, you know, big pools of capital. So big pension funds, big insurance companies looking to invest insurance premiums so that they will have money there to pay out to insurance um, holders, you know, when it's needed or really large asset managers. So, you know, institutional investors, particularly pension funds are really interested in these types of investments. And it's because they're long-term they're really predictable, they're steady returns, they're cash yielding, 
And, you know, if you think about it in, in a pension fund perspective, it's really nice to be earning six to seven percent on capital when you need to pay, you know, you need to pay pension beneficiaries in the future. These investments are not correlated with the stock market and there's increasing demand for green investments globally because investors realize that they need to, I suppose, manage their climate related financial risk that they're increasingly aware of. So there's just a, a clamor for these types of investments, particularly in stable markets like Ireland. And like you'll hear it said time and again, there's a wall of money out there, whether it's debt or equity, wall of money out there. So the point I'm trying to make is there is no need for citizen investors in these projects. And yet, what we're talking about in Firespall and in those the one country that's kind of you know quite mature on this um, ahead of us out of the group of partner countries is Germany and that was where a lot of our the case studies that are relevant for us have come from but um, there's a lot of focus there on innovative finance mechanisms to enable citizen investments in wind and solar projects so why is this if you don't really need the money so I suppose this goes back to you know and it's well elaborated in the 2015 energy policy, you know, national policy places citizens at the center of the future energy transition. You, you know, this is what Minister Ryan was speaking about, citizens, it's because we realize the energy system has to completely change. Governments and utilities are no longer going to be at the heart of it. Citizens and communities will increasingly be participants. And um, as a result of that, there are a number of actions set out in the white paper. One of them was to assess what are the best models for supporting community participation in some way, whether they're developing a project or whether they're investing in a project. What, is the, what are the best policy measures to support community ownership? And in 2017, Ricardo issued a report and it's a really good summary of, of um, you know, all of the key issues and what they've done in other countries. And really it concludes that the most efficient primary policy for supporting community ownership is the obligation for developers to offer the community, so developer-led projects, to offer the community an opportunity to invest in a project. And what they're talking about there is an obligatory approach that would be one of the requirements of accessing the renewable energy support scheme, so the auction scheme that's been referenced earlier. And there are, I, you know, I, it, there have been it published communications that that is being investigated about whether you can introduce that obligation through the Renewable Energy Support Scheme as part of some kind of a Renewable Energy Participation Scheme. Um, but that's obligatory. In advance of that, it actually is possible to achieve some of these national policy objectives, the same policy objective, through some of these innovative finance mechanisms that are being that we, we discussed in Firespall. And I suppose just to, to think about what are the benefits, they actually go beyond just being aligned with stated national policy that citizens should be at the center of everything. Um, it, there's a wide ranging literature and research, Celine McInerney down in UCC and has done a lot of research on this, um, that it's a, it's a really good way of galvanizing buy-in and acceptance for projects in a locality with a view to getting more projects through the planning process, basically. And there's also evidence that by enabling citizens to invest and get a financial return, um, the benefits extend beyond just the financial returns. It starts people thinking and it starts driving behavioral changes. And there's also evidence around that. And behavioral changes like suddenly thinking about, oh, should I be driving an electric vehicle? Oh, maybe this climate change, you know, maybe there are other things I can be doing. And I think that's, there's a key piece here about changing the narrative on climate from challenge to opportunity. You know, we talk, you know, we hear all about the time about what we can no longer do or no longer eat or no longer, you know, do on our land or whatever it is um, and how everything's going to cost us more because of carbon tax. And really there's an opportunity here to flip that narrative to, oh, you mean I can invest my money and I can get a slightly, you know, a better return than I would by putting my money on deposit with the bank. Um, so I think there is, there, you know, there's no better way of engaging people than I think through um, offering investment opportunities, provided they're appropriately structured, et cetera. And I suppose all of this, the benefits of enabling citizen investments is with a view to meeting the national 2030 targets and beyond that we've spoken about. And what are the role of local authorities in this? And I think Joe McGrath, put it you know perfectly by referring to the um climate action plan and you know the pivotal role that local authorities play as that trusted leader public sector leader and showing their leadership and also in mobilizing action in their communities and their um and their localities 
And I suppose local authorities can do this by raising awareness of their own decarbonisation investments, you know, showing leadership that way, ensuring the planning system is fit for purpose, of course, but also they can be those honest brokers that can foster collaborations, that can support public-private um, partnerships, you know, to, to get projects that wouldn't otherwise have gotten off the ground, um, off the ground, and as project partners in them, whether it's developers or financers, um, and also through sharing the types of solutions um, and types of innovative financing mechanisms that we're seeing through best practice in the EU and that we, we see as part of the Firespile project. <clears throat> and that's basically um, an introduction into the case studies that you're going to hear from next from Elias and from uh, Greg Allen of Community Power. But I will just mention one other project, sorry, one of their project, one of their recent, recent enough development that's quite interesting, and this is in the UK, so close to home, and basically it's an opportunity for citizens to invest in their local authorities. Um, and so basically the local authorities go out to citizens and they say we're raising funds to fund green projects, whether it's rooftop solar or solar farms, and you give us your money for five years and we'll give you a fairly low rate of return, 1.2%. But the low rate of return reflects the fact that these are very low risk investments because actually your return doesn't depend on whether the project is successful or not. Um, it actually, it, you're, you're lending to the local authority and so it's on the strength of that local authority rather than on the project dynamics at all. And there is some opportunity, some liquidity, so some opportunity to get your money back if you need your money back um, urgently within that five year period, you can sell your investment on a, a crowdfunding platform that they are using. And really, you know, this is exactly the objective we're talking about. It's about connecting citizens with local green projects and allowing them to make a financial return. And at the same time, it actually is quite win-win because you're also creating long-term income streams for reduced um, or reduced in energy bills um, for the local authorities. Um, and the, this this website, it is a crowdfunding platform. I'm I, I, not affiliated with it in any way, but they are quite interesting. And what they talk about is um, is interesting because we, we heard Mary talking earlier about energy democracy. They talk about democratic finance and about enabling that and really linking people with where the money is being used. It is a crowdfunding platform though, and you do need to be careful with all of these things. So that's why it's quite nice that it's a really low risk product that's, um, that's on the, the uh, platform um, because it's with anything like that you, you know consumer protection is there for a reason financial regulation is there for a reason what you really don't want is for someone to invest in renewables or, or a large group of citizens to invest in renewables and then lose all their money um, because they don't have any diversification of risk etc because that could totally damage the um, the narrative on climate change um, so with that, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Elias, um, who's the next speaker. Um, but just to highlight that there is a Firespile um, website that where all the case studies are up there. And there are, um, you know, lots of case studies and all of these other interesting themes. And we're only just touching briefly and up today on citizen participation. So with that, I'll hand over. Thank, thanks back. very much, Laura. And look, I think you've teed up the, the next the next speaker very well. And look, I'm conscious of time, so maybe we just move on with the with the three case studies and um, the next two case studies, just just to kind of try and get it back on track. So look, I'm happy to introduce Elias Breiter from the Ministry of Economics, Transport and Housing in the state of Hessen. I hope I've pronounced your your name correctly. Um, and Elias has been involved in the fire, a partner in the Fires Ball project. So over to you, Elias. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Laura and David, uh, for the introduction. And um, yeah, uh, Giard Witch from the state of Hessen. Um, I hope that uh, the connection is fine so far. Um, I highly appreciate um, the opportunity to join your webinar. So thank you very much for having me. And um, our regions are kind of different in a way. For example, uh, the CO2 emissions uh, Mary mentioned before, or um, the structure of uh, wind energy um, that uh, your uh, minister mentioned. Um, because, yeah, as you see, we are like in the middle of Germany and uh, have no offshore, for example. Um, but uh, we have the same goals in a way. Um, as mentioned before by, by David and uh, Kevin, like the uh, 
United Nations global development goals like the EU goals um, and uh, as Laura mentioned uh, also in Virus Poll for example um, where we got some of the best practices um, running yeah I think we're, we're great partners um, therefore and uh, I enjoyed the visit in uh, your region in 2019 um, and uh, yeah I'm glad to uh, have the occasion to cooperate and uh, I forgot one graphic um, that's what I already noticed by uh, our German um, federal weather service um, because it was mentioned before uh, the topic of uh, how to collaborate like on the European level um, maybe I'll send that uh, graphic later on um, it is um, about how many situations per year we have uh, that we um, need like re-regulations um, in our grids uh, due to uh, lack of uh, electricity generation by different sources um, and uh, for Germany for example it's uh, 23 situations per year when we just rely on onshore wind uh, so that's pretty much it's um, almost a month per year where we have uh, trouble with our electricity generation if you just use um, wind onshore uh, if you you if we use uh, wind onshore and offshore it's 13 days um, if we use uh, wind onshore offshore and solar power it's two situations per year and if you um, yeah, uh, look at uh, the, the situation on the European level, it's 0 0.2 situations per year. So I think that is uh, the best rational uh, for our um, yeah European energy union. Um, let me introduce you to um, the state of HESA a little bit um, so that you get um, um, yeah, a picture of um, of the state. Um, we are uh, the, the most central of the 16 German federal states. Uh, we have a specific role in traffic logistics, um, also in uh, grids and networks, um, of course. And uh, yeah, the area is around 21,000 uh, square kilometers, uh, 6.3 million people. And um, the share of our renewable gross electricity uh, gross electricity generation is uh, now 51 percent we are kind of proud of that um, but uh, regarding the primary energy uh, share it's just 11.5 uh, percent um, it's um, the topic is also uh, between like uh, the rural regions and the metropolitan areas um, so i'll put a, a focus on that to um, yeah make that um uh, to yeah big differences in a kind of way um clear so we have frankfurt rhine mine region with about 5.8 million people one of the commercial and transportation centers in europe maybe um you've uh, used the frankfurt international airport uh, for example we are a financial center um yeah we have the international airport and um we have the biggest internet node uh, relation density is up to uh, more than 3000 people per square kilometer and i'm in the uh, frankfurt city center right now um it's uh, like uh, yeah really really uh, many skyscrapers and stuff um the rural regions in hesse is uh, more than 400 uh, municipalities uh, with uh, 190 having town privilege um, but they're still pretty small in the most cases. We have 21 counties uh, in three different uh, administrative uh, regions. Um, Frankfurt, where I am, is uh, in the very south. Uh, we only have five cities with uh, more than 100,000 people and um, yeah, population density in some um, areas in Hesse is down to 72 people per square kilometer. Um, yeah, uh, regarding electricity uh, generation, um, as you see, um, unfortunately, it's out of our uh, monitoring 
uh, report. Uh, so the graphic is in German, but I uh, translated to you um, live. The um, green one is uh, renewables, of course. Uh, the purple one is nuclear power. Black is coal and yellow is gas and gray is others. Um, so as you see, uh, our share of uh, renewables is rising every year. And um, that is uh, the effect of our, uh, um, let's say, very ambitious uh, energy policy um, that we've grown. Um, nuclear power, uh, we have a shut off in, in Hesse, in the state of Hesse, and uh, soon in entire Germany, uh, fortunately. Um, and the share of coal and gas is also, um, yeah, kind of going down or, or staying at the same level. Um, but the problem is, as you see here, um, the renewable chair at uh, the primary energy consumption is still pretty low. It's rising, it's constantly rising, but it's uh, still pretty low. Um, uh, here, the, the uh, blackish striped ones is um, coal, blue is uh, oil, mineral oil, um, yellow is gas. Uh, yeah, nuclear is shut down, as I told you, in, in the purple uh, color and uh, green renewables. Um, the light blue is import and uh, gray is others. So uh, the problem is uh, why we still have uh, that high share of um, oil um, traffic is our most consuming uh, sector in Hesse. Um, more than 50% of our entire primary energy consumption is traffic because we're in the middle. Um, I mentioned that before that we are uh, pretty central. Um, we have a central railway station, um, which is uh, pretty important for entire Europe. We have that international airport. Um, almost uh, a quarter of our uh, entire primary energy uh, in the state of Hesse is just for airplanes. Uh, imagine that. So um, we have like more, um, yeah, jet fuel uh, than electricity in our entire state. That makes it kind of pretty special uh, to just, um, yeah, put that on the map. Um, but it's rising, and we now have a, a research center for renewable jet fuels, um, which uh, started one year ago. Uh, so we're yeah pretty ambitious about this sectors too. Yeah, now to some examples. Um, Laura already mentioned it before. Uh, you can hold an entire webinar just of one single topic or or financial mechanism. Um, so um, I I'm not trying uh, to uh, yeah explain it. Um, completely to you and every single one. Um, the, the message um, is uh, to give you an example. And uh, since we have a, a recording of this uh, webinar, you also can um, yeah, look it up later on. Or please don't uh, hesitate to contact me if there are any questions. Um, yeah, savings bond uh, as a participating model for renewable energy source projects. Um, that is uh, one of the, let's say, columns of uh, our energy policy in Hesse, since we are uh, totally convinced that um, participation is the key to acceptance, and our government is, um, yeah, has a has a big focus on acceptance of, um, yeah, renewable energy measures, and so we um, try to give people the possibility to participate and to get a comprehension of uh, what's going on and um, how the projects are running. Um, this one, for example, um, I think uh, Laura mentioned uh, that the ratios before in the financing model, um, we have 20% uh, by equity and uh, the equity was contributed by citizens and the municipality, uh, which is one of that uh, small towns I mentioned before. And 80% uh, was provided by the savings bank. Um, those savings banks are pretty special in, in Germany, I guess, 
because they, they kind of see me uh, state banks. Um, so they have like an uh, official task to, to fulfill, to serve the people and the region. And um, so they um, are often involved in uh, projects like this. Um, yeah, you see the resources needed and uh, the evidence of success. Uh, that was one of the um, yeah pretty early projects we had um, with uh, with a good outcome um, eventually. And um, you see the lessons learned, nature conservation and species protection issues arise. So uh, it's also like a, a counter flow. You need um, to participate people to grow acceptance. But um, when they are participating, they also um, yeah, get an understanding uh, of what's happening. And um, yeah, also put more maybe emphasis on on climate change um, entirely. Um, the other one is uh, Citizen Solar Power Station by the Solar Initiative, um, which is um, also one of the um, yeah, uh, best practices from our state. So um, the, the solar engine owners operate uh, solar stations together on external roofs so not on their own and um, they uh, invest in infrastructures of that uh, solar power stations and um, the association um, made by uh, yeah regular citizens uh, mostly is uh, taking care about leasing the roofs planning procurement and all that stuff so uh, all that administrative uh, stuff is like um, um, handled with uh, experience and um, not, um, yeah, um, needing uh, the, the the citizens' uh, involvement. Um, so the acceptance is pretty high, and as you see uh, in the evidence of success, um, we now have more than 250 successfully implemented projects. And um, I think that's kind of speaking for itself, um, but it's uh, also pretty impressive for a very local um, initiative that uh, has grown by uh, just a bunch of people at the very beginning. Another one is um, on a yeah, pretty high level, um, actually, by uh, the company uh, Aberwind AG, uh, which is um, also on the uh, stock exchange. Uh, you can uh, buy shares of uh, this company, um, but they also made shares uh, called Citizen Wind Shares um, to uh, allow participation in uh, wind parks that is grown by a commercial company uh, such as ABO. And uh, ABO has uh, several um, wind uh, parks and um, also other projects, I think in, in biomass and solar um, parks and stuff. But uh, the main topic is um, still wind, as their name already says. Um, for example, France, Germany, also in Ireland, I uh, remember when I've been to Waterford in uh, 2019, we also had a partner from uh, Abo Wind, um, who is um, one of the share, uh, uh, stakeholders in uh, Fires Pole. Um, yeah, so more than 5,000 shareholders already bought uh, shares of the Abo Invest. Uh, I think, meanwhile, it's called uh, Clearwise, but um, so they collect equity for renewable energy source projects and um, enable the further implementation. And I think uh, it's still like pretty much in the beginning uh, of that, um, I'd call it movement actually. In Germany, we have that um, yeah, uh, saying uh, the, the energy democracy or um, as, as mentioned before by Marie and, and Laura, uh, is uh, nothing less than the fourth industrial revolution. So I think uh, we can call it movement at that um, level. Yeah, um, the next one is uh, a, 
again pretty pretty local but um in cooperation with a commercial company a better rest um maybe uh that is um kind of well known also in ireland uh, crowdfunding for a renewable energy source project and um we had um yeah limited uh, equity capital and uh, it was about one um special building at the uh, at the beginning and um, they tried to raise equity and uh, the investments uh, were starting from 50 euro uh, so that is um, i think a pretty cool example um, because um, yeah almost everybody has the chance to invest and to be part of it and uh, therefore also raise acceptance and uh, yeah comprehension um, of such projects and uh, meanwhile they also have uh, some more um, projects and uh, even we now have one that is called Africa Green Tech for example um, that is uh, kind of tied to, to better rest uh, which are uh, running solar um, and uh, storage power plants uh, in Africa but developed in Germany uh, together with uh, African um, shareholders and stakeholders. Yeah. Um, average rate of return, I think, is uh, pre pretty uh, interesting in that evidence of success that is also um, yeah, a, good, um, a good ratio, I think. Um, yeah, last one, uh, I think, uh, is the Sun North Hesse. Um, local financing and involvement of private capital. Um, we have uh, municipal utilities, so uh, mainly energy supplies from Northern Hesse, um, which are equal partners to uh, the Sun. Um, it's Stadtwerke Union, uh, so it's like municipal utilities union, uh, North Hesse, um, with, uh, uh, yeah, 40, uh, 70, 4.9% uh, uh, of the shares go into uh, local uh, citizen energy cooperatives. And uh, this is um, in their uh, codex. And uh, they, meanwhile, they have a lot of uh, examples. I um, yeah, won't go uh, in, in depth uh, at this point, but uh, as you see at the sold uh, shares, uh, it's uh, it's a lot of effect. Um, pretty similar uh, with the savings bank in Darmstadt. Uh, so also in the south of Hesse, uh, we are again at that uh, savings bank, um, and uh, they have that um, official task to fulfill to to serve the people and uh, the region. And uh, so they also made, um, uh, as you see uh, in the example. Uh, about 1 million euro for common welfare projects and uh, they also have their own foundation um, which uh, also spends money. So if you have any questions, uh, yeah, don't hesitate to to, um, to ask and um, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Elias. Um, again, very interesting presentation, particularly all of the various um, I suppose options for for financing models. I think because of time, we might move on to to Greg, yeah. and then maybe if there are any questions at the end, or you know because of time, yeah. we might we might throw questions on after after the event. And um, so again, thanks very much, uh, Elias, for for your intervention and your presentation. And now I'd like to move on to Greg Allen. Greg is the Chief Executive Officer of Community Power, um, Ireland's first community uh, community owned electricity supplier. So over to you, Greg. Thank you very much, David, uh, and thank you to everyone. It's been very interesting so far. Uh, I suppose we, we uh, would just like to give a, a practical demonstration um, in relation to community power and what, who we are and, and where we came from. So, um, yeah, just in relation to community power and, and who we are, that we're a license, a community-owned license supply company, and we are the first of its kind in Ireland and effectively what we do is we buy electricity from generators and we sell electricity 
uh, and we grew out of Ireland's first community-owned wind farm, Templeberry Wind Farm. So what I would like to do is just to give a little bit of background uh, in relation to, to Templeberry Wind Farm uh, and the journey that it took uh, and what has uh, emerged out of that. And one of the things that has emerged out of that is, is community power. So uh, the local committee came together in 1999 to look at generation options in their area. Uh, and after uh, some consultation, they decided that they would focus on wind. And um, obviously back in 2000, so there wasn't very many wind farms uh, installed in Ireland. So they set up a uh, Templeberry wind farm uh, very much they wanted to have it uh, as a cooperative structure uh, and a democratic structure. So shares were offered to the local community and 32 local people from the local parish priests to uh, local people living in the area all purchased shares. And they also uh, assigned two shares to the local development cooperative. Uh, and those two shares were paid for by the 32 individuals. So uh, the actual temporary development cooperative is the largest shareholder in, in the whole development because obviously uh, shareholders are restricted to one share. It's, it's the basic concept of, of one share, one vote. So uh, as I said, the, the company was established in, in uh, or the cooperative was just established in 2000 um, and they went through the grid and planning process. Uh, and when they managed to get a grid offer, there was a moratorium at the time on, on grid connections because the, the national grid was being upgraded. So there was a the delay of two and a half years. And during that time, uh, they had got planning permission. And again, uh, Joe mentioned, or we, we talked about Tiberi County Council and, and uh, the progressive nature and the openness of it. Uh, and planning was granted, but uh, because of the moratorium, uh, potentially the planning was going to run out, so they had to reapply for planning, and when they reapplied, there were objections, uh, and that had to go to one ball plan, plan all that. and then when they wanted to actually develop, uh, when it went through that process, the financial crash happened in between 2000, 2007 and 2009, so financing the project became a problem. Uh, they did manage to do it in, in conjunction with the wind turbine manufacturers and, and the bank uh, that financed the wind turbine manufacturers. So they did manage eventually to get the, the uh, funding in place. So what has been installed is two 2.3 megawatt turbines uh, and they started generating in November 2012. So I suppose the key point in this is that the whole process took 12 years uh, and it was only through the tenacity of the local people uh, sticking with the project and having to put their hands in their pocket to invest more uh, to get through the planning process a second time uh, for this project to happen. Now, I think what has happened recently in, in the most more recent years is that there has been a lot of progress, progression, particularly in relation to planning and, and grid. There are still challenges, but hopefully it shouldn't take 12 years because that is a huge disincentive and I think it's the reason why there is only one community-owned project in the country, uh, which is Temple Dairy, and hopefully that will change now because of the res option and, and what's happening there. So um, out of that, um, during that time, the local community were, were, they were very keen that they, if they were generating power, why not supply, supply it to ourselves? So they set up a supply company uh, at the time, it was, it was a, a, there's two different types of supply companies. You have a small supplier and you have a large supplier. A small supplier, uh, you can have up to 200 customers. Uh, a large supplier, uh, you have to meet all the regulatory uh, requirements of a large utility. There's nothing in between, there's something potentially that could be looked at. So we had to go down the road. Uh, the, the, the supply company was set up originally for 200 customers, but because we wanted to uh, expand and, and help communities both in temporary and wider fields, we went down the road of actually applying for a license to become a large supplier. Uh, it was a challenge in, in relation to all the regulatory requirements and the billing systems and everything else. So we, we did uh, successfully uh, get our license in November 2019. So now we can actually supply electricity to the domestic market and the commercial market nationwide. Uh, and we're doing that at the moment. We're, we're growing our customer base 
uh, and we're integrated with a number of different communities. And we're really working to help democratize the energy market and promote the concept of a community energy citizen. And this links back to the clean energy package uh, and the renewable energy directive, where it has now become policy in Europe to promote the concept of a community energy citizen. Um, and during this time as well, we, we actually applied, and, and Joe mentioned earlier on, the, the CVPP and Tipperary County Council were one of the partners in this. The basic concept of a CVPP is a community virtual power plant. So this is looking at innovation within the electricity sector uh, of how we need to adapt. And the minister did mention that there, there's challenges with the load on, on the national distribution system. Uh, this type of project, will help, we'll always need a, the national grid, but basically what is is looking at is a virtual power plant where you generate locally within a geographical area and you supply locally using battery technology and energy management systems. So this project went on for two years and we were linked with, with three different, uh, our, our 15 partners in, in three different countries, the, the Netherlands, Belgium and, and Ireland. Uh, and we uh, worked on this project, it just actually finished in December 2000, but we, we actually applied for and got a capitalization grant to allow us to continue the research. So we have another two years and the project coordinators were the University of Eindhoven. Um, the Irish partners were ourselves, Community Power, the Tipperary Energy Agency and Tipperary County Council. And we also integrated it in sub partners, which is the Iron Island Jet Energy Cooperative ECTC, Energy Communities, Tipperary, Tate House, Claire Morris, Smart Power were, were the technical partners and Friends of the Earth. And this has really helped and harnessed uh, um, a knowledge base to develop between all between ourselves and all these different communities because as you're aware, the, the electricity market and the energy industry is highly complex. But this has really helped uh, ourselves to, to educate ourselves and we also have uh, identified shared values as to what we perceive as, as crucial for communities and community power, uh, uh, projects going forward. And it was nice to get some recognition uh, from the European Commission that, that there was a uh, EU Sustainable Energy Awards and our project won the Citizen Awards category. Uh, so again, it's, it's always nice to get that type of re recognition uh, from uh, the European Commission. Um, and I suppose just to, to go back a little bit in, in, in relation to the, uh, um, uh, the uh, sorry, the, the Interreg project, and David did mention to the minister in relation to grid and challenges with the grid, uh, what we would be uh, advocating is that if the grid is actually going to be upgraded within a, a region or a community or an area, that there is a certain parcel of that that is ring-fenced for community projects. Uh, the grid effectively is, is owned by the citizens of Ireland and we should have or be able to get access to it within our own community to develop community projects. Um, so we would see that as part of the solution. So really just to talk about, because this is about examples and, and uh, uh, just to go through the numbers a little bit, like a, a very basic, but Templary Wind Farm has two turbines, 2.3 megawatt each, uh, that's 4.6 megawatts. The turnover in a year is on average around 1.1 million euros. Now again, because of, of the foresight uh, of the Templary uh, community that they haven't taken a dividend and what they are doing and have been doing is reinvesting any surplus into uh, projects. Obviously the 1.1 million, there's, there's large loans and there's a, a quite high maintenance contracts to, to maintain the turbines, but any surplus is being reinvested and that has allowed them to develop uh, community power. Uh, we also have through that, uh, there is costs, as, as you would know, in relation to um, trying to get a, a, a project off the ground. So planning and grid connection costs for three solar farms, uh, and we submitted them in, in the res option. We were successful with two, uh, and there was one which was in temporary. We actually resubmitted it in, in the ECP2. It didn't get through the res one, 
Um, but that just demonstrates how uh, if, if uh, communities are empowered, that, that pay, basically they can reinvest in projects in their community. And we also supported another 15 uh, communities to prepare for, for ECP2. Um, and also, just to mention that, that I, I mentioned about the Interreg project, we're also involved in, in another project, which is called SENSE, and that was funded through the Disruptive Technologies uh, Fund by, uh, developed by the Irish government. And what that is looking at is peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading using blockchain technology, so effectively where you can trade electricity with your neighbour um, uh, and use blockchain technology as, as the, the uh, re revenue mechanism. Um, the International Energy Research Centre in, in Cork is involved and a number of universities around Ireland. Um, it's quite an innovative and progressive project, but this is where the electricity industry is going. And we as Community Power are trying to position ourselves uh, to um, be able to adapt these projects uh, and as they become real in, in the market. And they will form part of the overall solution. Um, so. Again, Kevin uh, gave a very good uh, presentation in, in, in relation to the uh, uh, res. Sorry, I, I've, I've kind of skipped one, so I'll just go back, uh, maybe just to talk about the, the res option. Um, and as you will be aware, there is a community pot for res, which is the Renewable Energy Support Scheme. Um, at the moment, uh, the requirement for community ownership is 51%. Uh, we would be promoting ownership of 100% uh, ownership. Uh, and the reason we would say that is that the pot for communities is quite small. It's, I don't know the exact figure, but it's one or 2% of the overall pot. Um, uh, so we need a combination of developer-led projects and we also need community-led projects. But we would be very strong that the community ownership should be 100%. Um, like, what I, I've demonstrated in the figures there that a lot of the money stays locally. If it's a developer-led project, there's a number of different uh, turbine, uh, wind farms across Ireland, which have been um, uh, packaged and sold, and they do form part of some global pension fund, and Laura mentioned them, and it is important. But um, what we would be advocating is, is that if, if it's a 100% ownership and the revenues can stay within the community, it offers huge opportunity and, and as we've demonstrated, Temple Dairy is showing how uh, that can happen. And in relation to the, the um, uh, Laura mentioned it as well, in relation to de-risking projects, and I think this is the crucial part for communities, um, that there is a, a community benefit fund, and, and the minister mentioned two, Euro, two euros a megawatt hour. Um, the, the biggest challenge for communities is to have the costs to go through the planning permission, feasibility study, planning permission, and grid, uh, and uh, then apply to, to qualify within the res auction. If that uh, risk is minimized for communities, then it opens up huge opportunities. And I, I always like the, the example in Scotland where um, the Scottish government give a, 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 a grant to communities to go through that process. If they are successful, the grant is repayable. If they are unsuccessful, uh, the, the grant is written off. So that really demonstrates how you can de-risk a project for a community. Um, and as I, I mentioned earlier, the, the benefits are, 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 are have huge potential. So again, sorry, and, and yeah, Kevin you, you went through a very good uh, presentation on uh, Rhesus and, and what's involved. Uh, and it's obviously closely linked to, to climate change and the clean energy packet. Um, what we would suggest is that the local uh, authorities have a, an opportunity to expand the investment. And I think that's very clear and uh, has been demonstrated by Joe and, and obviously what's happening at a local level. Uh, we would be advocating and see an opportunity to, to support community-owned renewable generation. There has been a huge focus on ownership of uh, business innovation centres, and that has demonstrated and proved uh, to, to create employment locally. This is another sector, I think, that has uh, an emerging possibility uh, to, to actually help communities and, and create employment. 
and we're already working with a number of different local authorities, including Donegal and Mayo and, and Tipperary and, and Offaly. Uh, we'd be very keen to work with others. Um, the two examples that I would give in, in Mayo, the, the, the solar farm that we're being, uh, that we are developing, it was an old landfill site, uh, and we have worked with Mayo County Council, and now it is actually going to be a, a renewable generation site uh, and community owned as well. And similarly, I know in, in Tipperary, there was a small uh, landfill site and 33 kilowatts of solar has been put in there. So it just shows uh, the integration of local authorities, communities and renewable energy and the potential that it has. Um, so um, what, I, what I would finish by saying, this is the, the, the last slide, is, is that uh, Templeberry is uh, an experience that demonstrates uh, the power of communities if they're, given, if they're given the possibility and the potential. The revenue stays within the community, um, and you can see that we, uh, through Temple Dairy, they have set up uh, community power that is employing four people and that is expected to increase uh, this year. Uh, we have two solar farms expected to be built in 2021, um, and we're sharing our knowledge with other communities, uh, and we've also helped 15 communities. So, really, what, what we're advocating is, is that if, if it can be de risked and, and uh, communities are given the chance to demonstrate uh, their, their potential. Uh, they can really shine and, and, uh, and be a leading example. And I'll just finish by saying that generation, uh, we believe, is the key. Uh, most uh, funding that you get from national, uh, um, uh, local and uh, European uh, funding is uh, between 30% and 60% or 80%. So communities have to find the balance of that funding. Um, if they have a generation project, as, as has been demonstrated by Temple Dairy, they have a revenue stream where they can match that funding uh, to do whatever project they want, even outside of the whole uh, energy sector, if they, if they want to uh, put in a community park in, in collaboration with the local authority they have a, a funding stream to do that. So we would be very much advocating generation and this is why we, we are trying to support as many communities as possible to get into the res option and to get a generation project up and operational in their area because I think it really does open up huge opportunities. So I'll leave it at that and uh, thank you for, for listening. Uh, and I'll back to David. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, again, really very interesting. And I think it's a really good example of, I suppose, community empowerment, community engagement, and probably resilience as well in terms of sticking with the process, particularly through the early years, but also, I suppose, demonstrates the um, the opportunities and potential that, that exists in, in that whole area. Um, look, unfortunately, we've gone, we've gone well over time, so I don't think we'll have an opportunity to pose any direct questions to Greg, Laura, uh, and Elias at this stage. Um, but look, I, again, look, I'd like to really thank them for the, the um, presenting the case studies. Any questions that have come in or that will come in, we will forward them through to Greg, um, Laura and Elias and, and come back to the to the participants um, at the event today. Um, look, we're, we're, as I said, we're going well over time. So look, I think at this stage, I think it's really just for me to, to wrap up. I really like to thank um, all of our speakers here today. I think really, really um, interesting uh, um, presentations from everybody and I think the fact that we have so many attendees still on the on the webinar so late into it really is is testament to the the interest that that's in this topic but also to the caliber of speakers that, that we've had you know we, we've heard I suppose about the ambition um, at regional level and national level in terms of of delivering on on, on these and um, but also I suppose the the challenges and what needs to be done in terms to achieve these ambitions we, we've heard you know, I suppose about the level of commitment at government level, at national level, at regional level, at local level to try and, and deliver on these ambitions. But obviously, investment is still a critically important aspect of this. But again, through the case studies, we've heard about the the options and the opportunities that that are out there to, to try and harness that. And um, as I said at the outset, and um, really today was about I suppose about testing the waters with regard to a renewable energy investment forum. 
So this possibly could be the first in a series. Again, we'd be very interested to hear your feedback on that, whether you think this is um, a useful useful tool or a useful mechanism moving forward. And we heard from Laura that, there, you know, based on the work that, that she done, she did throughout the, the project, that there is strong support for the forum, particularly, I suppose, looking at four key pillars around be informed, which is what today was kind of about, be connected, connected, be inspired, and, and be, in lead, be a leader. So again, we, we would be interested to hear your feedback, hear your views um, um, on, you know, whether this is really a good option, whether there's merit in a forum going forward. And then I suppose I finished by putting a call out that maybe others might step up in terms of hosting a similar event if you think it's a really good idea. Obviously, we will support you in, in, in that regard, but maybe just to come forward with your ideas and maybe um, a volunteer to step up to host, host similar events. So look, with that, um, I think I'll thank everybody for the participation, thank the attendees for sticking with us and for getting over the going over the, the time so much. And at that, I'll I'll just close the event. Thank you very much. Sorry, just to say, I'd like to thank all of the people in the background as well who are, organized the event on, on, on our side. Um, a, lot, a lot of work went, 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 went on behind the scenes in terms of managing the technology, getting the invites out and so on. So just to, to thank everybody there. Thank you very much.